We are your home theater and AV questions answered. This is AV Rant. Want your home theater or AV question answered by Tom and Rob? Send it to question at avrant.com. Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, and I'm here with... Rob H. This is AV Rant. It's your home theater and AV questions answered. Uh, we've got oodles and oodles of questions this week, because uh, we, we left a whole bunch from last week and uh, got, got piles more new questions, many multi-parts, so I... I like made the executive decision to keep the news very short. If you wanted news about LG's OLED prices and Samsung OLED prices, I didn't bother next putting week. that in news. Uh, it might not even be next week because you can find that information easily everywhere. And the upshot is everything either stayed the pr- same price or got a tiny bit more expensive due to inflation. That's it. So uh, mm. really very little change. If you were hoping that this is the year that OLED prices come way, way down, nope, not the case. Nope. They stayed the same or got a little bit more. So that that's the news for that. Hooray. It was so easy. Hooray. <laughs> uh, so for those of you that we were struggling uh, naming last week's podcast and I almost oh, a little bit, sure. said something like Tom goes to the dark side because I decided to <laughs> back up my surround back. Surround back speakers. Um. So okay. I hooked him back up, okay. and I don't know. Psychologically, maybe I'm hearing a little bit more sound coming from behind me. Sure, I'm not. I'm not listening to the same content I was listening to the first time. So maybe it was just that content. Definitely I, could be different. Uh, I will tell you that I'm my top middles are amplified. I have an external amp for that. Okay, and I'm getting yeah. that. The amp is clicking, <laughs> and the speakers are clicking and it's driving me absolutely bonkers yeah that's bad and i i mean it's not like all the time and it, you know what I, it's, I'm, I'm probably the only one that's going to notice it in this home home theater but it's driving me so i just turned it off yes I just turned it off yeah it only happens when like there's a loud sound there's louder sounds and it's not that loud i mean it's only top middles how loud can it right. possibly be so i don't know what's going on with that thing i'm very irritated so it's only loud I, it's sounds got, is kind of click i mean like that kind of sounds like it might be a clipping issue but could be, but how? Yeah, the speakers are three feet away from my freaking head. And your trim levels aren't jacked way up or anything like that. So the- no, I mean it's just normal. But I, I, the volume knob on the amp might be a little too high, so maybe I'll have to rerun. Yeah, Would I have to rerun the Odyssey. I could just no. lower the volume and then just do a, a just manually trim. change the trim level. Yeah. yeah, I'll try it. I mean, it that's kind of what it sounds like to me too. Right. I switched to. So I'm using the same speaker wire I was using for something else. <laughs> yeah. So I know it's pretty sure it's not the speaker wire. Yeah. Uh, I thought I actually thought the, the surround backs were amplified, and I just turned the amp off. Mm. I was like, oh, the surround backs sound exactly the same. It doesn't do anything. I'm like, oh crap, that wasn't actually, it was no. actually top no. mills. So uh, and then I thought, oh well, maybe the guys who were working in here clipped one of the in wall speaker wires. Okay. I'm like, wait, the top middles are not in wall mm. because I ran them much later. So yeah, it's probably just the volume level on the stupid amp was too high. But no, it could be that. that. I mean, the speakers themselves could be damaged. Something wrong with the tweeters or something is causing a clicking or, or it could even be the woofer. But it's, but it's li- like, I, I actually, it's not, like I say, it's, it's the amp and the speakers. I hear them from both things. I oh. actually went down and put my face near the amp and waited for it to click. It does click. Oh, like, like it, a it's, relay it's, is clicking or something? It, it's what it really sounds like. That, so I, it has right. speakers A and speakers B it on does. there. So I switched from speakers A to speakers B to see if that would make a difference and it didn't. No. So I don't know what's going on. Mm. With that thing. I might need a new amp. <laughs> which I, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to get a Fosse. In case anybody's wondering, that's what I'm going to oh, get. Oh yeah, you're I'm still get... using your Dayton from back in the day. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't. I don't think that's yes. it. But <laughs> you, you never I don't think it is either. I don't know what it is, but it's. And this is the thing. Everybody's like, "Oh, well, you guys are experts at home theater. We are." Yeah. And listen to us. I just presented you with a problem. You're like, I don't know. Could be a bunch of stuff. I'm like, I know. Educated right? guessing. That's really all Educated it is. Guess, Educated guessing. Try a uh, uh, process of elimination. That's that's kind of kind of the only thing we have. we have procedures yes. that we can recommend. We can't necessarily go straight to the problem. Yes, I. Um, yes. Yeah. So we are. Um, we, we got a lot of questions, so we're going to try to get to them yes. quickly. Yeah. Uh, uh, is there any other updates personally that we're supposed to do? Did uh, I talk about anything last week that I was supposed to I mean, the only other thing on? would be uh, the battery update from the Sound Pete's, because we might as well keep track. 79. Of I got it down to 79. 79. There you go. 
God down to 79. I mean, and I, I can't listen to them anymore for quite some time because I've got like a backlog uh, of headphones right. to do now because I've been listening to these dang things for months. That's right. <laughs> I, got, I can't listen to them anymore. I've got other headphones to do. <laughs> it's the stupidest thing. Just well, but buy also them. awesome. <laughs> I mean, it's it's fantastic. insane. It's nuts. I can't believe I'm still talking about these stupid headphones. They won't die. As long as they stay. Like, I'm alive. not even close. I'm not even 50%. That's right. Like, yeah. Even if they, even if they, when I got to 50%, they dropped off like a rock. Right. I'm at 79. Yeah. We've been talking about this for like Still six weeks. Very good. Very, very good. Even if at some point the battery readout is completely incorrect and they drop off a cliff after that. It doesn't matter. They have still lasted doesn't matter this long. Anymore. That is just doesn't matter. objective fact. They have lasted this long. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what did you watch, Rob? Yeah, I just watched one movie this week, uh, which was The Holdovers. Uh, this was from 2023. Uh, Paul Giamatti, uh, very much the star of this movie. Um, I like him. It becomes uh, pretty close to a three-hander. Uh, it, it could have been a play. I don't know if it was adapted from a book or a play. It's the type of movie that, that definitely feels right. like it could have been. Uh, Dominic Sesse, I'm not sure how to pronounce his last name. Uh, according to his IMDb, hasn't been in a ton of other stuff. Uh, so he's right there, you know, beside Paul Giamatti throughout this whole movie uh, as, as the primary scene partner in that um he had his one big monologue scene that i i didn't feel quite quite delivered up to the same level uh acting performance as everything else it was the one scene in this movie that that felt uh like i was watching a performance <laughs> it, 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 it didn't uh, it entirely convince me what was going on there but i don't want to be too harsh on the fellow it's pretty hard uh trying to be at the same level as paul giamatti who has a heck of a lot of experience and has always been an excellent excellent actor sure. um and then divine joy randolph uh who is is she's a larger uh broadway star uh, but has been in a, a few things, uh, movies and TV at this point. Uh, she was excellent in this. Uh, she she was mm. she was really fantastic as as sort of the uh, uh, the the second supporting actor in this, or or, or sort of third co lead. Uh, but the main thing about uh, the holdovers is that it is very much and very intentionally a throwback. I mean, so intentionally that the studio logos that come up at the beginning of the movie they use the 1970s version uh, versions from uh, Universal and uh, I forget the other uh, you know co producing studios that were part of this but they used all the 1970s logos to give you the feel. Mm. Uh, and it's set in 1970. Uh, it's the Christmas break between 1970 and 1971. Uh, that's when this movie is set. And okay. everything about this movie is a throwback to movies of that time. It uh, sort of has the look of a movie of that time, although uh, cleaner than a lot of what a, a film would have been shot there. Um, even the audio, I noticed, was sort of produced um, not exactly like it would have been in a 1970s movie, but like they clearly had the thing where, yeah, they recorded this this on set there's noise going on there when they had to amplify certain lines to make them intelligible the noise came up along with it they didn't try to clean it up in a way that you could do today but wouldn't have been able to do uh in the 1970s so so everything is very much a throwback including the entire style and story of this movie very reminiscent of uh sort of dead poet society herald and maude okay. uh you know movies of that era where it's it's talking it's all people talking and the the I'm mystery really against those kinds of movies yeah i mean it is a straightforward drama it is a straightforward drama okay. told linearly we're not doing any type of weird you know rashomon or or jumping around in time or anything like that this is a straightforward drama it is a talking movie and the the mystery what keeps you involved is just uh you know we're meeting this curmudgeonly guy paul giamatti's character uh Got you know it typecast huh oh wow yeah can he <laughs> pull guy. that off um yeah i what I, 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 I obviously we, ne, none, neither of us know him but no we, it'd be interesting because i mean he just he, he plays that character so well you know ever he since the merlot, very, very the merlot well. thing right <laughs> what was the napa one where oh, yeah, he yeah. hates merlot yes uh oh um, gosh i'm forgetting the name of that yeah i'm forgetting the name too but uh you know he plays that character so well and i just can imagine like if his his real person personality is so much different that you meet him, you're like, wait, that doesn't make how <laughs> does that make any sense? Supposedly, he's a very, very nice man in real life. Uh, but yes, I mean, I hope so. You I'm know, so sick of finding out that people are terrible. All, Can all we of the uh, stop that, the intrigue of this movie is is just you know finding out what what brought these people to these stages in their lives. Um, sure. It had a bit of a thing where um, you know it felt like it was going to be uh, maybe this you know collection of students. The, the, the idea what what is the holdovers are it were at a boarding school and. And uh, it's the students who, uh, for whatever reason, have to stay over the Christmas break 
because uh, their families are away or right. whatever it might be. And we it sort of starts out with the feeling that, oh, it's going to be this collection of students and he's the teacher who's who's left there to look after them over the break. Uh, but, but very quickly, we end up with just one student being left. Uh, the others manage to uh, be sort of whisked away on a, on a trip rather quickly. And it's not a group of students movie. It is a one-on-one movie, uh, Paul Giamatti and Dominic Sessa's character. Um, Angus, I think, was the character's name. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it, it gets a thumbs up from me, but I mean, it's certainly not going to be any type of like home theater demo. It's not going to be anything that uh, like even really you know, tears your heart out or something like that. It's a straightforward drama. It's a throwback. We don't really get a ton of movies like this very often anymore, but it is well acted. It is well written, and and it's it's one of those movies where like yeah, that was that was a that was a good drama. Uh, but I wanted to make one note on the technical side of things, which is just, I haven't noted this about a couple of previous movies where I, I noticed it, but I just didn't talk about it on the podcast. And that is just aspect ratios of these movies that have been made in 2022, 2023, uh, getting into 2024 now. Uh, this, The Holdovers, was presented in a 1.66 to one aspect ratio, which is just slightly narrower than your HD TV, which would be 1.76 to one. So there are very, very small pillar box bars on the left and mm. right, um, but filling the full height of your 16 by nine screen, but 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 slightly narrower. And then going back to uh, Saltburn, that was in a Academy ratio, 1.37 to one, and the whale was in 1.33 to one, the old four by three uh, TV shape that we had there. So I mean. All of these movies, modern, up to date, being shot in these uh, more square uh, aspect ratios. Uh, again, you know, all the folks with their two point three five to one uh, cinemascope screens. If they're doing the projection setup, I'm like, yeah, that is that is some big blank space to the left and right. If you're watching one point three three to that, uh, but I did note, I'm like Saltburn in that Academy ratio, that that old school one point three seven, just slightly wider than four by three. I like. It, it it got a bit of an emotional reaction to from me. I don't ex- I can't really tell you why, but there was something about that exact ratio. I'm like, there is some magic in that number for some reason. I don't know what it is. It, it's like it, it just it has a feel to it. There's there's really no denying that the the aspect ratio choice does impact the feel of a movie. So uh, yeah, uh, just a, a note that was on my mind. There, I'm trying I mean, to keep it short. I'm done. Yeah, you nailed it. By the way, we've said. <laughs> Uh, we've said that multiple times that, or at least I have, that I think that uh, aspect ratio should be a directorial choice based on the content that's being displayed. Definitely, you know, and 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 shifting these aspect ratios as the the movie goes on or the show goes on, we saw that a lot, of course, in uh, uh, the Wandavision. Sure. When you. It, Clearly, when they're going from different eras, they yeah. were shifting uh, or uh, from real world to what was happening inside the hex. It was very, uh, very appropriate to have that happen. Son, For if sure. you're going to come in, you need to just use your big old head and push that door open. Tom said, son, but he's, he's talking just, to a doggo. <laughs> he is talking to a dog. And that dog is just standing there like perplexed. Mm. He's like, I don't think I can fit. In or like, out. Eat. Whatever, dude. Figure it out. All right. So I did not watch much this week. Mm. I, I tried. I just couldn't get my family either out of my way or me to stay up late enough to do anything. So mm. I watched, uh, or I, I guess I should say I rewatched the first three episodes of Ahsoka. Oh, okay. So I had already seen them, though I didn't remember them perfectly. Sure. I remembered enough of them that I could have probably skipped it, but <laughs> it was good to rewatch them. Uh, oh, yeah. Now that well. I've seen all of the Rebels right cartoon because yes. I, I watched that yeah uh, which i almost kind of wanted to re-watch the last episode but i remembered enough of that, that it's <laughs> fine. um i do still think that everybody needs to talk a little bit faster like come on okay we got places to be yes yeah this, that sort of thing it, and we got used to of, their cadence in rebels and animation almost always speaks faster than they do yes. in live action yeah well and i just think in general that this for whatever reasons feel feels a little too slow. Okay. Like I think, especially uh, Ahsoka. Okay. And I don't. I, I mean, Rosa, Rosaria Dawson is a great actor. I don't she think is. that that. I think that that was the the notes that she was given, and she performed as expected. Or be as asked. deliberate. So I, <laughs> yes, be deliberate. Like okay, but be deliberately a little faster, <laughs> Yo, in my opinion. Could be. But I see what they were going for, yeah. and you know. Jedi's are supposed to be a little bit aloof and a little bit, you know, not really emotional and that sort of thing. So she's definitely doing that. But at the same time, I feel like I'm missing 
something. Here. Okay. But maybe it gets better as it goes. Uh, I will say, and I thought I actually spent all of Rebels looking for Ahsoka's ship. Okay. Because I saw the first ep- three episodes of Ahsoka and I was like, man, that spaceship is freaking cool. <laughs> I don't think it's very practical. Like, why is this wing thing spinning around like this? Other than the fact that it's cool. Right. Like, why? What? I mean, it sort of makes sense that it would be it... like horizontal when it's in an atmosphere and there is air for it to act like a wing. Well, you know, but how you see them turning... in atmospheres and it's 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 vertical. All how the does time. turning does... vertical out in space make any difference? Because if it just stayed horizontal, wouldn't have a lick of difference out in outer yeah. space. But but it is so but cool. It <laughs> Because it makes a better I toy. love that ship so much. <laughs> you know, I just do. I'm not like, and there is something so quintessentially Star Wars there about is. a ship that that is flat. Yep. You know that 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 turns to the side. The Millennium Falcon it turns to the side <laughs> to go through narrow spaces that That's other what you ships crash do. into. Yep. It's so quintessential Star Wars, and that ship, I just. Love it. I love right. it so much. So um so far enjoying it. Uh the 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 note at the end of the first episode for our friend Ray makes yeah. more sense now because I did not know that the first time I saw that I was like, I thought they were talking about you know, Ray from the movies. <laughs> oh, like, I see. Did, did, did they spell that with an E? So uh I was a little confused. But yes, that makes a lot more sense now. So, you know. And it it is very interesting seeing him in this sh- this it's such a like, shame. I can't get I, the I can't get the Punisher out of my mind because right? he played True. the Punisher. He did, and it's like he's already imposing. I mean, that man is big. Yeah, he's he a big dude. Just, he is just imposing. Yeah, because that's um, I'm forgetting her name, both the character and the actor, but uh, the yeah. the partner that he's with, uh, the blonde yeah, the, the blonde woman is that he that he's with Bjorg looking girl. Well, yeah. she looks little because she's standing next to him all the time. She's not a yeah. short woman. She's like five nine. <laughs> So. Oh my god, he is just a wall of a human being. I mean, and, like, you would swear she's like five two, five three, because if he was exactly a normal right. sized man, that's about the height she would be, just judging between the two of them. But yeah, she's like five nine because he's like six five. So Oh my god. I uh yeah. Uh, yes. Yep. Yes. All right. Uh, so that's what we watched. We I'm did. gonna try to finish it this week, and uh, I do, in fact, when the my wife wants to have a movie party over here for her friends, where they're gonna okay. watch um, Oppenheimer. Oh yes, yes. good, good. She's good. like, oh, we have to watch it together first. I'm like, listen, I don't care. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't care. It is a three-hour investment of your time. So. I don't think I don't think you're gonna make it through the movie, mm. and I don't think I'm gonna care enough to make it through the movie. But I'm sure it's very good. Uh, I will say, having a home theater back. Yes. Oh my god. That, that, Being that's without one for so long, like having it back, even though it's clicking and making weird noises and being <laughs> a little odd, you know, and pissing me off from time to time, you know, and I was a little, you know, setting things up the way exactly I wanted mm-hmm. them and going through all that stuff. Even with all that, it's just nice to have a sure home is. back again. Absence you made know, the heart just, grow fonder. That's great. It just it it makes everything so much better. It does. <laughs> then headphones and a <laughs> small screen, and there's a reason why we spend money on this stuff. That's it's worth it, it when you get it done right. Mm-hmm. All right, this is AV Rent the podcast that answers your home theater and AV questions to get your questions answered. All I have to do is ask us by emailing us at question at avrent.com. Go to our website, find our episodes, our show notes, and our Flickr album so you can follow along with the images that we will be talking about. Uh, you can find us on uh, Facebook.com. Not right now because it's down. Okay. <laughs> I just checked it. I didn't know about I mean, I that. just checked. The, before the podcast, I noticed that it was down. And I went to isitdown.com or whatever ah, it's called. Ah, right. And gotcha. it is, in fact, down. Okay. Uh, so Facebook.com slash podcast, YouTube.com slash avrant, where you can listen to the podcast and glance over whenever we're talking about a picture because it will be up on the screen. Right. That's Rob what it will is. will do that for you because mm-hmm. Rob's, Rob's a good person, <laughs> unlike me. <laughs> That's not clicky. True. I have a clicky amp. Ah, so. yeah. Oh, Drops speaking of things that do weird things, my computer last week, I was complaining about the fact that the trackpad, I, it, the trackpad stopped working. But you know, like how when the lights go out, the power goes out and you still walk into a room and you flick a light, you flick the light switch sure. on, and you look at it like, why have you betrayed me? Yeah. Um, I I kept trying to use a trackpad. And go, oh, yeah, that's right. It doesn't yeah. work. So I would grab the mouse. Right. Well, one day it worked. <laughs> so now it's working again. I don't know. What I, and, I mean, I literally did nothing. Self-healing? So, it's, I got a Wolverine and a laptop. I don't know what's going <laughs> on. 
Contact Rob directly, Rob at avrant.com. His socials is at first reflect. I'm Tom at avrant.com. I don't do socials. Okay. Not, I mean, I do Facebook, but yeah. <laughs> it's down. <laughs> and forever, I don't accept for, I don't accept. Yeah, that's right. It's down forever. Thank God. <laughs> what a cesspool that place is. <laughs> I would have guessed that that Twitter would have gone down, you know, permanently mm. before that. I'm still kind of shocked it's still around. I know, right? I suppose. <laughs> I know. But I guess uh, uh, it takes a while for something that large to. If you're willing to burn the money, I guess. Yeah, I guess. Kind of thought that it some is horrible could. scrolling through it on the official app these days. It is I, a terrible experience. <laughs> I have not even tried. And like it's it's like every third post is a promoted post from some awful person with a blue check mark. It's just it's a terrible experience on the official app. Well, I'll have to take your word for it. <laughs> yeah. I stopped using Twitter so long ago, <laughs> and when they ch- changed the, I will say that I did notice that the Voodoo Fandango app now has okay. a new logo. They're like right away, Fandango like the next at day, home. I. W- I, I, it still says Voodoo on the, my oh. app. There's a Voodoo <laughs> and then Fandango underneath. Yeah, it. Fandango. So underneath I, they're gonna it. they're gonna do that thing for a while. They're gonna get rid of the Voodoo entirely, <laughs> which is fine because it makes just as much sense as Fandango does. Sure. Like neither one of those words mean anything to me. I thank our listeners of the week to become a listener of the week. Support this podcast in some way. One of the ways you can do that is going to avrant.com, click on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee link, and send us a PayPal donation. We want to thank Raf. And Dane for doing that this week. Raf and Dane. Thank you very much. That is right. Raf and Dane, thank you both very much for your PayPal donations. We very much appreciate your financial support. If you can't support us financially, we understand. Just do something to support us and we will mention you here. Oh, wait a second. Uh, if you want to support us every month, you can go to patreon.com slash podcast. Sign up to become a monthly contributor. So we have 129 patrons right now. We thank each and every one of you. That's right. That's patreon.com slash Podcast. if you'd like to sign up or re-sign up because the number keeps going down. But oh, well, that's the way it goes these days. We completely understand if that was intentional. But if it was unintentional, if it was just a a credit card error, then uh, yeah, patreon.com slash Podcast is the place to go to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation. A big, big thank you to our 129 patrons over there right now. Thank you very much. We thank each and every one of you. Mm -hmm. One of these days, we should have a patron-only podcast Eh. just for our patrons. I guess. I mean, plenty of other podcasts do it, but... I don't understand it. I feel like that's... It's to try and encourage more people to sign up and pay money. That's what it is. I suppose. Yeah. I mean, I know what it's for, Yeah, but it just feels... Like, if I'm going to do the work, I want everybody to... (laughs) I know, right? (laughs) I don't like paywalls. (laughs) I don't either. I hate paywalls. That's why I, I resisted doing a PayPal, uh, uh, a Patreon for a long time because yeah. I was like, ah, it feels dirty. It feels, <laughs> I don't know, it's communism or something. Is it communism or socialism? I can't remember. It's one of those isms. It might be capitalism. I think it might be capitalism. Yeah, that's probably the closest one, honestly. <laughs> All right. If you can't support us financially, we understand. Do something to support us and we will mention you here. Dane gave me permission to use his photos on avgadgets.com where I am the editor-in-chief and many good articles are published once a day at 7 a.m. Yeah. During the weekdays. So if you want to get your daily dose of usually home theater related article, mm-hmm. 7 a.m. Eastern time. Check it that's out. That's where you go. AVGadgets.com. Dane, thank you for giving that permission to Tom. We also got some notes of gratitude for keeping the podcast going through. All I don't know. The, the things. The Supreme Court almost always does something terrible, and I know that they're probably doing something terrible. Of right the now. United so, States, oh, anyway. The United States. <laughs> that's true. I am very United States centric. I don't know. You guys have a Supreme Court? We do. do yeah, there's a Supreme Court of Canada. Absolutely. Does, you, does it do terrible things too? It doesn't really show up as in the news very much for the well, Supreme that's Court of Canada. It's doing good things. Yeah. It's, it's, I mean, it's, we don't report on good things anymore. It's just rage. It's fairly boilerplate. All of the political rage in our country is pretty much directed at one man, which is silly Minister. because that man can change and the party can still be in power. So yeah. <laughs> I'm like, I'm, I like your system better than our system. I'll I'm, be honest with you. I'm, I'm, I want to vote for a, for a, for a ideology and not a person. Yeah. I don't like voting for a person. I don't quite, like I'm, any of these I'm people. quite all right with it. I'm like, absolutely, if you want to direct all your rage at the one person who can who can be swapped out without swapped actually out. making a political change in this country, go for it, because I'm, I'm fine with that being the way it goes. <laughs> I will say that as a Floridian, and I say that trying not to spit at the same time, because I don't feel like a Floridian. I grew up in California, and I will always f- identify more with California than I do with Florida. Uh, we do get a lot of snowbirds from Canada down here. Sure. And... The ones that come to Florida from Canada, they don't 
they have bumper stickers about your man. They don't like him very much. Oh, I, I could see that. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we also got the notice credit, too, for getting the podcast going from Dan, Ryan, Jay, JR, Brandon, Dane, and Alvin. So thank each and every one of you for thanking us. That's right. That's Dan, Ryan, Jay, JR, Brandon, Dane, and Alvin. Alvin, making sure he mentioned he's a member of the Two Hour Plus Club and listens all the way to the end, past the end credit music there. So thank you all very much for your notes of gratitude and encouragement. They're very much appreciated. And a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. All right, we got some news here, even though Rob said he didn't do it. <laughs> From Carl, M&K Sound has announced their new $5,000 each IW500 in-wall speaker model, the first from M&K to reach the to receive the THX Dominus certification, which means it plays stupid loud. That's the biggest certification they've got. It's past Ultra 2. It's Dominus. Dominus. Yes. Is there an Ultra 1? Not anymore. There used to they, be THX Ultra, then they updated it, and it became Ultra 2. Yeah, but they didn't. They don't keep. They didn't keep, they the, didn't keep the ultra one. Yeah, no. which is stupid. They just keep it as ultra. Well, no, because it was just it was an updated spec bump to what they were testing. Whatever. Became ultra two. The IW five hundred uses a one inch soft dome tweeter and aluminum waveguide, and they make no bones about it. They call it a horn loaded design, which is a first for M and K since they've always opted to use multiple tweeters in the past to achieve higher output rather than a horn loaded tweeter design. They claim this is new. That's new owners though. Like M and K is well, you know, it's funny because hands. yeah, uh, I mean, again, I think because they're yeah. back to being, well, so they used to be M and K, uh, Miller and Kressel, then yes. they became then then that went away for a while, and then it kind of got resurrected as M K Sound, no more and symbol, no more ampersand, it was just M K Sound, and that was around for a while. Now they are M and K Sound, so it's like. A third iteration of this company, and I, I don't. I, they're still a Danish company, but I don't actually know who the owners are anymore. But yeah, the official name is back to being M and K, but Sound. So it's M and K Sound now is the official company name. All right, I'm trying to get a better look at these stupid speakers because the yeah. the thing you linked up, you can't really see. It's the just back a press of it. release. Yeah, it's not yeah. a ton of information. I wanted to there. see how deep it is. It is. It's meant to be inside a wall. Yes, ninety-eight something. Millimeters? millimeters? I'm guessing millimeters. I would guess millimeters. <laughs> That's how deep it is. Okay. Uh, they claim the waveguide allows the IW500 to be installed either vertically or horizontally while still delivering the desired off-axis off response. Now I got to go back and look at it again because I thought, oh, it's oval though. It's got it oval. is oval. Yeah. So it's that a little That indicates to me that maybe they're maybe lying a little bit. <laughs> but then again, it's got the two mid-range drivers that we're just about to talk about on yeah. either side. So that's that's doing something with the the oval shape of that waveguide yeah, sure slash horn. So right. yeah, yeah, I don't know. Uh, anyway. On the other side of the tweeter above and below, if, if it's uh, vertical, mm -hmm. are a pair of three-inch mid-range drivers, also in waveguides. And as we touched upon last week, since they know these speakers are being mounted in wall, they have designed the crossovers with rather high frequencies, 2,500 hertz between the mid-range and drivers in the tweeter, and 800 hertz between the bass woofers and the mid-range drivers. Mm -hmm. The bass woofers are a pair of eight-inch drivers positioned to either side of the mid-range driver. So tweeter and center, then two mid-ranges, then two. Bass woofers. Uh, when installed vertically, they all form an extended Diapolito array. Sensitivity is 92 dB, 2.83 volts, 1 meter. With 500 watts po power handling, you deliver up to 117 dB output. The THX Dominus certification means they can handle room sizes up to 6,500 cubic feet with up to a 20-foot listening distance. With their sealed design and close adherence to the THX design recommendations, their specified uh, frequency response is limited to 80 hertz uh, to 20 hertz plus or minus 1.5 dB. 20 kilohertz. Sorry. 20 kilohertz at the top, of course. Pl yeah. uh, plus or minus 1.5 dB, which means they play super flat. Yep. All the way down to 80 hertz and probably drop off like a freaking rock. But, um, no, I mean, they're sealed, so it's not going to drop they, off like they a rock, should but at the same time. the THX yeah. 12 decibel per octave roll-off slope uh, starting just above 80 hertz, because these are these are adhering quite closely to uh, yeah. the THX design recommendations. So they're going to have that 12 dB per octave slope on the bottom end, meant 
intentionally to cascade with an electronic 12 dB per octave slope that is in your AV receiver or pre-pro yeah. uh, acting as the uh, high pass filter on the bottom end of your speakers 24 there. 24 dB. Gives you a 24 slope. dB. The Linkwitz Riley crossover with the 24 dB per octave slope on the top of the subwoofer and the bottom of the speakers there. So yeah, uh, all designed to THX spec. They are not attempting to have these speakers play low, low, low down into the bass. Uh, that's not what's going on here at all. And uh, they're not going to claim that these are playing up to 40 kilohertz or something like that. They're like, this is about volume output for a given cubic footage of air and a given listening distance. And we're going to hit those specs. And I have no doubt that they do. Uh, yeah. THX, even though that has changed hands multiple times at this point as well, that is one thing that they are very good about. If they are going to give you that THX Dominus certification, it is going to hit reference vol uh, volume at the uh, specified distances there. So there it yes. is. Yeah. Yep. I mean, $5,000 a pop is a lot. <laughs> but a lot, I guess but if you, you know, to, not... To get out this amount of volume in that amount of space, yeah. it's not an unreasonable. It's not and, more than... Uh, yeah, it's not a shockingly yeah. high amount of money. You know, it's it's no. a lot of money, but it's it, it could be worse. <laughs> APC is bringing a couple of new battery backup UPS models to the top end of their more basic uh, back UPS series, mm -hmm. dubbed the back UPS BE series, the new BE 900 G3. It's $160 MSRP. Mm -hmm. And BE 1050 G3, it's 180 bucks. offer higher capacity than the previous top end back UPS models, which is 850 uh, Volt amps. volts. Volt, Volt amps, amps. yeah as well as some nice quality of life updates. Both models give you six battery plus sur uh, six battery and surge outlets, mm -hmm. plus another two surge only outlets. Yeah. We'll note right away that the battery produces a stepped approximation of a sine wave. These are not pure sine wave units, which means you don't really want to use them with your, what, computer? What, uh, what are we not using them with? I mean, PlayStation 5 would be the most common thing that, that these might have an issue with when running on batteries. Some uh, computer power supplies for sure. Uh, with these, um, yeah, modern day computer power supplies, which the PlayStation 5 also uses, uh, that style of power supply, they seem to have some, some issues occasionally when using a stepped approximation of a sine wave to run them. So yeah, might not want to use it specifically for those devices, but for almost anything else, perfectly fine. Yeah. So APC mentions directly that it's okay to stack other devices on top of these back UPS BE models, and their two-tone black and white finish is meant to blend more easily into your rooms and your homes. The lead acid battery inside is easily re easy to replace. It, I mean, if you they, you can click on the thing and they'll show you what the battery looks like. Yep. It looks exactly like a little like a like a motorcycle. Battery. Like a little car battery. Yep. Yeah. That's the technology. Uh, it's got. One USB A and one USB C port uh, on are on the side, and mm -hmm. with a sixty watt load, they'll run off the battery for about an hour. Naturally, the ten fifty has greater uh, supply wattage and run for slightly longer than nine hundred. Um, I could not find in any of their information, and I looked mm -hmm. there uh, if it's sending through fifteen amps or what the deal is as far as like if you I mean, to just, plug your receiver yeah just it. given the values that are there my guess would be these are capped at 12 amps when they're running yeah. off the battery uh just you know calculating what would make sense for the values that they're giving right i looked at the 12 I, I think it said in one part of it that there 12 amps is what you could get out of the up the usb port which was a weird thing to say but that's what it mm. said so it would make more know. sense if that's 12 volts coming out of the usb 12 volts maybe that's what I said. yeah that's probably yeah. it but yeah just calculating it, it it would make sense that 12 amps is sort of the limit from this battery not 15 yeah so you wouldn't want to plug your no this is not for your high powered subwoofer yeah. amplifier this is not for your high powered separate amplifier or but you could use it for your projector i think oh yeah you know? that should be fine for any projector yeah. absolutely and plus, and because you can stack things on top of it, yeah. it's, I mean, it doesn't look like a home theater piece of gear. It That's looks right. more like it's supposed to be next to Sonos or something, but it'll it'll be okay. Some comments here. Steven, we inadvertently helped him solve an issue that recently cropped up in his system. We've had several mentions of mysterious hums in people's systems lately, hums that are not ground loop hums, and he had one too. He uses a pair of SVS SB13 Ultra subwoofers with RCA connections to his Yamaha Pre-Pro. He also uses a Velodyne SMS-1 to his to EQ his subs that is like old school. That is my going son. back that a ways. Is, that, that is, is not going been back. Sold for a while. I loved mine. Yeah. <laughs> with you, I think that 
there should be like room correction. I know that that's that they'll never be this, but it would be nice to be able to, to do to do with SMS. So if you don't know, S, the SMS one, you set up a microphone and then you plugged it into your system and into your subwoofers and stuff like that, and you could have it put out like a sweep, mm-hmm. and then you could see the, the, the what the the measurement microphone mm-hmm. was was seeing on the screen on the graph yeah and then you could change your eq on the fly and it was just parametric <laughs> eqs built into that sms one it wasn't anything it more was sophisticated automatic. than that yeah and it was it, all manual it wasn't it was all automatic manual. uh but it was nice to be able to like see the it. real-time feedback you're like that's they, what and, adjusting and were, the cue does <laughs> yeah and people were complaining oh it's one third smooth that's not even right. really let's well, shut up <laughs> just shut up. What did you like? Why can't we just enjoy the thing that we have that we didn't have before? Mm-hmm. Well, it's not the most perfect thing it could possibly be. Shut up. No one likes you. Go in your corner and don't talk to anybody for 30 minutes. Okay. Till you've learned your lesson. Anyways, SMS one. Awesome, man. All and there right. was a, there was a kit that you could buy that you could hook up five microphones. That's to, right. And then send it across your whole thing. Real and time really spatial screw yourself averaging. Up. It's pretty yeah, cool. man. Uh, he was using a 3.5 uh, millimeter IR input jack to remote control that SMS1, but it stopped working. No problem. He thought, I'll just stick an IR flasher on the front. And that did indeed allow him to remote control his SMS1 again. But right after he made that change, one of his SVS subs started producing an intermittent and seemingly random hub. It would come and go. It would change in volume. It didn't seem like a ground loop hum at all Mm -hmm. but thanks to hearing us talk about cables picking up interference he double checked and sure enough when he's making those changes to his ir setup for the sms1 its power cable had gotten pushed right against the rca cable going to that humming subwoofer and simply moving that power cable away got rid of the hum he was rather surprised the power cable feeding his sms1 it's just skinny 12 volt style power cable and it was only right up against the rca subwoofer cable for a short distance but as soon as he moved it away that hum stopped so that's all it takes, apparently. We helped right. him solve an issue without even knowing it. Also, you need better subwoofer cables. There's something, yeah. I mean, uh, yeah, if that's really properly shielded... Uh, it shouldn't happen. shouldn't really have been that bad. I will say, um, you know, those skinny power cables, I mean, they can be they throwing can. off uh, yeah. a remarkable amount of uh, electromagnetic interference because there, there's obviously no shielding on a power cable. And those, you know, e- even though it seems ironic that the skinnier one is worse than the thicker one, that can absolutely be the case where there's just a, yeah. a pile of EMI flying off of that power cable. So that's not super surprising. But yeah, if there is a good shield on an RCA cable. Now, keep in mind, many cables with RCA yes. jacks don't actually have shielding because they're just a twisted pair inside and they're marketed as an audio cable with an RCA jack and that's a terrible design you, you want the coaxial cable with the shield inside furthermore you want the shield attached on both ends of the cable and many times they don't do that because if you have an actual ground loop having the shield attached on both sides will make the ground loop audible and they're like we're kind of fudging getting away with you having a ground loop by just not attaching the shield on one side but then you don't have a properly functioning shield which is another problem. So there's multiple ways that sound could be leaking into that RCA cable of yours, and uh, who knows, maybe just replacing that subwoofer RCA cable with a good coaxial shield attached on both ends. You can get it from Monoprice, because they do it properly. Doesn't have to cost much at all. Uh, That might have solved this problem too, and then you can wrap it in a power cord and it still won't (laughs) Every time I hear people talk about, you know, oh, you got to keep your this away from that, I'm like, just by it used to be that it was really expensive to get nice cables like nicer cables. and then it was like blue jeans which was kind of expensive but a lot less expensive but than still everything that was a lot out less there. expensive yeah when, i remember when blue jeans were like the value leader by a mile yes that's and right. now i'm like eh, they're kind of pricey they are <laughs> compared to moto price <laughs> daz uh into the questions here daz's living room is wide open with the vaulted ceilings they do some casual tv viewing in there sometimes this theater is in the basement where most stuff gets watched so his plans for any acoustic treatments and upgrading the speakers and subwoofer in his living room have been a low priority while their renovations to their house get completed but with most of the construction out of the way now, their attention is now turned to how the living room is going to is going to be set up. Mm-hmm. He railed for years against them ever putting a TV above the fireplace. But as proof of concept, they moved the TV in front of the fireplace on the TV stand. They removed the mantle, and now there's just a piece of exposed wood sitting flush with the stone fascia of the of the fireplace where the mantle used to be. He has to admit, in terms of functional flow uh, for the room, it does work a lot better. Okay, so we got some pictures here. We do. 
I think you need to cover up that piece of wood because it looks weird. <laughs> I mean, he, he's intending to just mount the TV in front of the fireplace fire, so I guess they're thinking they'll just yeah. leave that piece of wood there. Uh, yeah, might when, as well, yeah. When, when the next owner takes the TV down, they'll have a little discovery waiting for them. Yes. Surprise! Yeah. Uh, so they're basically committed to mounting the TV by the fireplace. It will end up a bit higher than where it is right now, just sitting uh, on its TV stand. First things first, when mounting the TV onto the stone above the fireplace be a fairly simple DIY task, or just something you should hire a professional to do. Here's my problem with the stone. <laughs> is it actually stone? I mean, you will usually know, but mm-hmm. a lot of times it's a stone fascia, yes, and you don't really be. know what's behind it. Sometimes... You know, so- it's styrofoam <laughs> that, that, just, that just looks like stone. I mean, it's probably stone, but it could also be like a a very sort of brick-like crumbly material that just yes. has the look of stone on the outside. Yes. Yeah, all these things are definitely possibilities. So what I mean, I am I would be very uncomfortable myself uh, installing anything into Me that. too. Uh, into that stone fascia. Yeah. I would want to have a professional do it. Yeah. Uh, or at least doesn't... somebody knowledgeable. I mean, it doesn't have yeah. to be a professional. It needs to be somebody who has at least done it once before. Yeah, and mounting just... a TV on a fireplace fascia is, is that 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 doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. That doesn't have to no. be a super expensive expenditure to do it. I I would err on the side of, I'll let somebody else do that and, and yes. make the mistake <laughs> if it is. Yeah, <laughs> I mean... It's one thing to, you know, use it in drywall and find your studs and do all that. That's right. not, I mean, most people have done something along those lines before, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. even if it's just hanging pictures mm-hmm. or something like that. They've done something along those lines before. But this is, a, to me, it's a little bit yep, more. Yep, I'd pay a little bit of money out of pocket, let yeah. a pro handle it. Yep, that'd be so my So he doesn't take. want a sound bar. He's determined to have at least a nice 2.1 speaker setup, and he wants it to sound better than any sound bar would. Go get those Kef Tower speakers. There. Yeah. <laughs> At the moment, he's using a pair of his old uh, or old pair of Pioneer Andrew Jones bookshelf speakers that mm-hmm. with the matching Pioneer 8-inch sub doing as much as it can in this large open space, which is <laughs> farting away in the corner. It's powered by his, his old, everything's old, Onkyo 646 <laughs> that he doesn't particularly like. He doesn't intend on upgrading all of that at some point. So we got all kinds of pictures of this room. Yep. Not only is the poor little subwoofer completely underpowered and <laughs> yes, under, it is. you know, whatever, but it's also in the corner on a shelf. Yep. <laughs> looks like it's in timeout. Kind of looks it's like it's sideways too. In order I, to know, fit in there. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> it's got Living extra its wires life. going to it just in case. It like does. here's some extra wires. You need all the help you can get, son. <laughs> the idea is to wall mount a pair of bookshelf speakers on the other side of the fireplace next to the windows. He already has uh, some video secu uh, speaker wall mounts he can use since they expect the TV will be mounted a, a bit higher than where it is now in terms of Looks, do we think it would make sense to wall mount the bookshelf speaker so that the tops are in line with the top edges of the windows? How much will, have a comp- uh, will that compromise the sound quality? Where the hell are the windows in this thing? Oh, I see. Yeah, if you see the very um, last image there, you can you can see the windows on either side. I, I get what he's saying, right? Just pure aesthetics to have the top edges of everything all line up. Um, so I don't. I, I think that it will look... I think that that would actually look weirder than just having the t- this. Like, I don't necessarily. Like, there's okay. So Reddit will tell you you need to absolutely lower those speakers so that the the tweeters are at ear level. I don't okay. think that makes a dang bit of difference here. Really, you're too far away. I mean, it can make a little difference, but yeah, not I, life and death difference. Sure. Yeah, I don't think so. Uh, so <laughs> I would center them so that the the, the boxes are centered in, on the height of, of the, the TV. TV. Yes. yes, I agree. I think I that, think that would agree, uh, just aesthetically would yep. look the best. I think yep. if you push them all the way up to the top, that would just look. It kind of looks like blank space yeah. on the left and right of the television. Yeah, I completely agree. I would have the yeah the the speakers, whatever they might end up being, because you you might end up changing what those speakers are. You right. said that's a potential upgrade that you would do, but yeah, I would have them so that yeah they're they're like centered to the height of the television that I think would aesthetically look best. And yeah, next to the windows, I, I don't think that's going to be any sort of problem because they don't they they're not the same color and shape and size as the windows. Yeah. They're you're going to know that they're speakers, so I think that makes the most sense. And that will alternatively help you, you could put them on like furniture like they are right could. now basically yeah, you could. if you if you even if you move the tv up and you left the speakers low like that mm. i think that's fine too because mm. it, they connect to the thing that's on the ground so they yeah, don't if they're like at the height of the stand that's below yes. the, the television or something like that i sure. think that that would be okay mm-hmm. um but if you're gonna wall mount them yeah. center them on the tv Done. that's my yeah. agreed 
So he doesn't want a sound bar. Oh, wait yeah, a second. I scrolled up to go look at pictures. Uh, blah, 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 blah. How much would it uh, Now, as far as how much would that compromise the sound quality, um, I think that this is a compromise in sound quality anyways. So let's not, let's not, let's not care that much about that. You know, uh, putting up super high is more compromising than yeah. lowering them down a little bit. Yeah. Yes. But I don't think that, I think at this point we're doing things for aesthetic reasons. So let's make sure, it, let's not like half do things for aesthetic reasons. Right. Let's just do them for aesthetic reasons and then deal with the consequences afterwards. So, um, in theory, you're, if, if you are so off access to those tweeters that they are, um, you know, you're getting, sl- you know, lowered volume mm-hmm. because of it, your room, uh, you know, uh, correction program should bump up that yeah, a little bit. Yeah, to some bit. extent, yeah. You know, so to, to help correct that, you're not going to get great sound in here anyways. You're going to get good right. sound, hopefully, yeah. is what we're going yeah. for. We're not going for great. We're going for good. Um, he'd like a new receiver. It will live in the bookcase shelves that are over on the right side wall. He wants it to be slimmer. This is Onkyo 646. He wants it to have a better room correction than AccuEQ. Well, that's not hard. That's a low bar, at least. Hey, have you heard of the SMS-1? <laughs> <laughs> Good luck finding one of those, but... I gave one. I think I gave one to Goodwill or uh, Salvation Army, one of those places. And it wasn't that multi-channel, ago. that SMS-1. It wasn't multi-channel. <laughs> it wasn't multi-channel. It was just for the subway. Um, uh, he wants it to have a phono input, but not be too expensive. Any mm-hmm. suggestion? You know, I want to have all these things, but I want it to be cheap as chips. Sure. Uh, accessories for less. Accessories for less, your friend. If you want sure. it to be small, your option is... The Slimline. Moran Slimline. I, I don't think anybody makes anything else, do they? Not really, yeah. I mean, yeah. that's certainly the the easy uh, go-to there. Now, for $500 at the time that we're recording this, uh, Accessories for Less is selling the NR1711 model. Uh, it does have a dedicated phono input, including a ground plug. If your turntable requires a phono level signal and needs a ground connection, it's got those ready to go. Uh, of course, if you have a turntable that just outputs line level, you can use any of the regular... RCA stereo inputs. Uh, it does have a single HDMI 2.1 input. That's the model year we're dealing with when it was the NR1711, back when uh, Den and Emirates had their uh, models with a single HDMI 2.1 uh, HDMI port on the back there. So that's what uh, the 1711 has. Seven channels uh, can power them all internally, or it does have pre outs only for the front, left, and right, and then two subwoofers. Of course, that is just an internal Y splitter for those two subwoofer outputs on the back of it. Uh, but yeah, the room correction that comes with the 1711 is just regular Odyssey Mult EQ. It is not XT, it is not XT32, but regular Mult EQ is better than Onkyo Accu EQ. <laughs> So Everything's I, better than the AccuEQ. What are you talking about? I think we've pretty much checked all the boxes there. Now, if you're like, I want to make sure that the AV receiver I get is the slimline design, but it has all HDMI 2.1 inputs, uh, then you could step up to the current model, which is the Cinema 70S. That's the current slimline model. Accessories for Less is selling it refurbished for $750. So it's definitely a price increase. Uh, but there are feature increases. I think I actually do think it looks nicer. I think the fascia on it is a nicer aesthetic design on the Cinema 70S, but that's probably not worth $250 alone. However, uh, all of its HDMI uh, ports are HDMI 2.1. That might be worth it for you. It also has a full 7.2 set of pre-outs. So if if you're finding the 50 watts per channel, uh, which that could genuinely not be enough depending on the speakers you're using in a wide open vaulted ceiling living room with a pretty decent seating distance. It could be the case that adding an external amplifier is not completely out of the question in this scenario. Uh, so this would let you add, add external amplification for all seven channels if you want to. It's still an internal Y splitter for the subwoofer. It's not independent level and distance settings for those two sub outs. Still has a dedicated phono input with the ground pin. So yeah, checks all the boxes there. If It's mainly the HDMI upgrade that you would be going for if you want to do this. And that could be worth it. So I'm just going to say that one thing I'm concerned about here is the size of the space. And the fact sure. that you're still, you're still looking at bookshelf yeah. speakers. I have no problems with bookshelf speakers. I got no problems with bookshelf speakers in this room at you know, at this distance. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just you want it to sound better than any soundbar. Yeah. And uh, they probably will. But it's still going to be underwhelming, I think, as a whole for you. Mm-hmm. Uh and I, I think the the big problem is going to be your volume output. You know, you're okay. just gonna, you're just not going to get the amount of volume you want out of these things. Uh, 
and and I understand wanting to have rim correction. I I want mm-hmm. rim correction. Mm-hmm. I don't necessarily think it's all that hugely important here. Because I, I, the, you're not going to do room treatments. You're not going to have... You're well, you're going gonna... to do some room treatments just to try and get the overall echoiness of the room down a bit. But it's not going to be specific spot treatment in here. I know. But I just it's not going to make that much of a difference, I don't feel. So um, I would, as, as an option, I'm going to mm-hmm. throw out there, uh, powered speakers connected directly mm-hmm. to your TV with everything. You know, with what are you going to use... With this, uh, I know you got the phono input that you're mm-hmm. talking about right here, but uh, you know you can find like the f- uh, Andrew reviewed the Fluence Tower speakers, okay. which are like the five hundred self powered five hundred dollars a pair. They right. have a subwoofer output. I think yeah. they have a they have a uh, they have some tone controls in there, okay. so you can do with some DSP stuff to them. Um, you know, yeah, you're you're. They have RCA inputs, so mm-hmm. if you uh, and they have an optical input, so you can like take whatever's coming from your TV down to these things, sure, and th- with one optical cable. And as long as with your phono, you either have a phono preamp or you have yeah. a turntable that just does line level output, like the Audio Technicas that we always recommend. Give you a switch to either do line level uh, with the internal preamp or uh, phono level uh, if you want to use an external preamp. So yeah, if you have a turntable with line level or you just have a phono preamp, you I can think just use regular. RCA. You can save a chunk of money. Okay, but of course these have to be on the floor. Okay, so yes, you know you're do. not going to be wall-, wall mounting these, but you That's know right. maybe they're going to be f- flanking either side of the 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 uh fireplace anyways mm-hmm. they might not look that bad and i'm not saying you necessarily have to get these but think about what yep. you're really trying to option. achieve here yeah because what you're trying to achieve here is essentially you know you you are looking to pay a lot of money for room correction and phono inputs and other things that i don't necessarily know that you're going to get a lot of use out of mm. uh and I, I don't mounting. know if he was planning to go to surround sound because that, of course, is yeah. a consideration. If you are planning of to course. go to surround sound, then just a pair of self-powered speakers isn't going to give you that. So yeah. uh, I'm not I'm not sure if that's the plan, though. Yeah. So I, I would think about that sure. uh, very carefully because I would rather have a lot of output in a space like this so that if you're having a party or if you're in the kitchen and you still want to be able to hear the TV, you know, I mean, you, you're not worried about essentially blowing up your receiver or mm-hmm. damaging your speakers because you've got these small speakers that yes they look fine mounted on the wall but mm-hmm. you know and then but you're you going to be paying get... for room correction that's going to make marginal I would I would say probably marginal difference yeah but you here. could get high efficiency high output bookshelf speakers like HSUs would be a great sure. choice in a room like this and then if you get some capable subwooferage not the little 8 inch pioneer then you could you know come at things that way and you'd sort of yeah. split the duties all right. Uh, last question here. He asks, anything else leaps to mind? Any pitfalls we think you should be aware of other than the one I just mentioned? Mm-hmm. Any other advice to make the process of, of installing this change uh, go more smoothly? Um, well, go ahead, Rob. I can yeah. see what you're going to talk My about. My only so thought was uh, you might want to consider a flat speaker wire. Uh, yeah. Mono price is uh, is an easy choice there. Now, they have the type that is like flat in shape, but not like uh, completely flush to the wall flat. Uh, but this is very easy to uh, route and mount and, uh, you know, sort of visually hide. So they just have their regular flat speaker wire. And then uh, it seems as though Mono price has kind of done away with their self-adhesive, really, really super flat speaker wire. So we're back to Sewell, uh, which we always used to recommend. Sewell and their Ghost Wire, uh, which they've actually lowered the price. <laughs> so not quite as low as mono prices used to be, but they brought the price down a little bit on their Sewell Ghost Wire. So this is self-adhesive, super duper flat. Um, you can mud right over it and paint it and have it completely visually disappear into the wall. Uh, so that that's just one thing to be aware of, That uh, especially if you are going to wall mount speakers on either side of that fireplace. Uh, rather than having to route the speaker wire inside of the wall, uh, which going around that fireplace, who knows, might be a bit of a challenge. There could be an issue getting yeah. it to the other side that type of thing is what i had in mind so that's why i thought okay the flat speaker wire that you can paint and visually make it disappear that might be something worth considering sure uh again yeah so if you're going to go with the subwoofer it's going to need to you know you're kind of stuck because Mm -hmm. you want to have something big that can fill the space but you actually don't want to 
totally fill the space because it's going to make every <laughs> dish in your kitchen rattle right. and your, your your teeth rattle and everything else. So it is one of those cases where you're like you're you're not really wanting to pressurize to fully pressurize the space. Not the entire house, um, no. Yeah, so you end up kind of wondering where you're going to go with this and. Mm. Again, as much as I love subwoofers, and you know I do, there's a, a case to be made here for just getting, just using your speakers that can play down to where they can play mm. down to, and that's what you got. You know, you're not really going for that big bass. You go to your, because you have a home theater, you can go there for that. So it, it's a it's a catch-22 as far as I'm concerned. I don't know that. That's, that's the pitfall. The pitfall is, the pitfall I am warning you about is don't do too much in this room. Okay. Because I feel like as somebody who is as knowledgeable as you are and cares as much as you do, it's very easy to spend way too much and get very little back for it. And here I would rather just go, I want something loud. <laughs> and I, however much bass I get is how much bass I get. I mean, it's all be fine. Todd. Todd is in the process of building his new home theater. He is going to have two rows of seats and he had in the mind that he wants a Two pairs of surround speakers, one for each row. The thing is, his new room is not the same width all the way from uh, front to back. For the front row of seats, the room is 14 and a half feet wide, but it's two feet wider at the back where the second row would be. The mm-hmm. left wall stays the same, but the right wall is two feet further away. He's you, <laughs> you can put them on a pole. Stick them in well, that, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, He's using Moran Cinema 50. He's wondering, can he connect one pair of surround speakers to the Cinema 50's binding post, but then connect a separate amp with its own volume control to the Cinema 50's surround pre-outs? Are the speaker binding posts and the pre-out jacks both powered at the same time? Uh, yes, they are. They are indeed. They are both active at the same time, as long as you have obviously not done the thing of manually turning off the internal amplifiers, because that is an option on the Cinema 50, yeah. is you can go in there and say that the surrounds are pre-out only. Uh, but of course, you would not do that. If you do not do that, if you leave it at default, then the pre-outs and the binding posts are both active. So you could connect them both. So he just wants to make sure he can properly level match all four of the surround speakers. Mm-hmm. You think he might even use a mini DSP to make sure all four surrounds are really properly time aligned. And level matched. What do we think? Well, it'll be time aligned. I mean, I mean, the dis- the difference between the speaker wire connection and going through an amplifier is negligible. Uh, Nobody's just amp. thinking true physical distance, right? He's got. Yeah. He's going to have at least one speaker that is like a physically different distance from the other three speakers uh, from the microphone. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, basically, the 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 simplest solution that you had in mind will work because the pre outs and the binding posts are both active at the same time. Uh, but you do only have the single trim level setting that'll get right. that'll get set for uh so you need an those. amplifier with a volume knob yep yeah so you would want the amplifier with the volume knob uh might even get into the scenario where uh you actually use the external amplifier to like amplify both speakers on the right side of the room and then use the speaker binding post to amplify both speakers on the left side of the room uh that, that's not completely out of the question even though that feels very asymmetrical um yeah. that that's sort of the situation you're in an asymmetrical situation so an asymmetrical solution might be the way you end up doing it the mini dsp um probably overkill probably really yeah. not necessary but it it could be done because then you wouldn't actually be using the binding posts on the av receiver you uh, you've got you know two in four out with the mini dsp 2 by 4 hd so you could have independent level and distance settings uh in the mini dsp but then you'd actually need four channels of external amplification uh to do things that way so that that could be done that way the other solution could be uh you don't wall mount all four of your surround speakers for the one that would have necessitated being physically farther away if it were wall mounted you stick that one on a speaker stand and now yeah. they're all the same distance that that could yeah. be the other way you come at this i'll be honest with you that's so much easier than everything else you're <laughs> probably on. <laughs> i mean just that one yep uh or i mean literally mount it on a pole hanging from the ceiling yep. or you know what i mean i know it's gonna look a little goofy or whatever but um put that pole on a hinge and you can like <laughs> <laughs> Pull it up with a string and then lower it down. I don't know. That would be interesting. Uh, but, yeah, it'll work. It'll yeah. work. Dean. The last time Dean wrote this was about two years ago. We talked about the oh, – we've been talking about you behind your back for two straight years. So. Haven't we, though? It's just been I, Dean. Just Dean. Dean the punching bag. Not 24-7, <laughs> but tw- 22-7 because we had two hours is cut out of there for the podcast. That's right. <laughs> uh, we talked about – so it was Rob and I just bagging on Dean behind it his must back. must have been. 
I have no, I wouldn't have a clue what you had asked two years ago. Nope. I don't know what my wife That's asked me this morning. Put the reminder in there. We talked about the orientation of his room and he asked a bit about soundproofing. Well, that narrows it down to like 97% sure. of the questions we get, as well as acoustic treatment. On the soundproofing front, we asked him whether the goal was for this room to be truly uh, dedicated theater, if it is. Or if it's just a nice room where he, uh, he liked to watch movies. Mm -hmm. Because the extent of the soundproofing could be wildly different in terms of price and complexity, depending on the actual usage of the room. The truth was he didn't know at the time. Or didn't know for sure at the time. Mm -hmm. But now it's become quite clear. This is just a nice room where they like to watch movies. So okay. he insulated above the drop tile ceiling, which apparently he had. I did not remember yes. that. Fit two pairs of bookshelf speakers in between some ceiling joists and visually hid them with some false uh, ceiling tiles. Made some acoustic panels for behind his couch and on the side walls added SVS cylinder subs. Yes. Mm -hmm. Upgraded his... his <laughs> it's not, like the only thing that I care <laughs> that if people... Like I don't care that your speakers match mine. Uh -huh. I don't care if your projector or screen matches mine. I don't care if your seats match mine or your receiver or your amplifier or your power protector or anything where matches mine my your remote control no but if you have cylinder subs yes. you're gonna get the fist bump every single time <laughs> added svs cylinder subs upgraded his tv went from seven floor level speakers down to five like we suggested and flipped mm -hmm. the whole orientation of his room 180 degrees even though uh we had suggested a 90 degree rotation uh so he's just over he was just overachiever there <laughs> but having the room be wider than long just didn't feel right to him that's fair enough I so get you on that. Here's his, we got some before and before after and pictures. After. Yes. If you want to see them, go to youtube.com slash AV Rant Podcast or AV Rant or whatever it's called. And then, um, yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, Out of everything, good. he thinks that having just dug in and finally calibrated his sound system and carefully matching the levels of every speaker to reference volume probably made the most notable difference. But he wanted to share his results and then ask, is there anything further we could think uh, he needs to do at this point? He's open to any suggestions. He knows his overhead speaker is not ideally placed, but there is duct work and other obstructions in the ceiling, so placement was rather limited up there. Mm -hmm. The overhead speakers are maybe. Yeah, so the, the overhead rear speakers are very close together, basically directly over his couch. Uh, are those which, are those acoustic panels behind the couch there? The as far as I like, know, yeah, I'm not a hundred percent sure, but like maps or something, huh? They, they do. look like maps, which is a great thing of... to print on there. It looks like decoration yeah. fits right in. Wonderful, yeah, I love it. I like it. Uh, yeah, and uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, acoustic treatment. I mean, honestly, you know, if if we were decking this out as a fully one hundred percent dedicated theater, there's probably a bit more acoustic treatment that could be done here. But yeah. you've treated the most problematic spots you've treated the first reflection point on the sidewalls you treated directly behind your seat which is like number one number one so yeah i think you've done a good job there yes the spe positioning of the overhead speakers is a little bit less than ideal but there's a perfectly reasonable explanation for why that is and yeah i don't know you know for the ones that are basically directly above the couch maybe those aren't giving you very much left right separation because they're they're more or less directly beside each other uh, a bit like how surround backs are sometimes placed very close together like they are in the back of tom's room uh but you're still getting yeah. some front to back steering you're still getting some left to right steering uh especially in front of you you'll have left to right steering so i think you've done all right there yeah he just has the one sub i only um, see one sub um i don't remember i see a sub but next to the couch there is for sure on the left and i don't yeah. see i don't see a second one yeah anything else I mean, I think he's done a darn good job in here, you know. With what I think so, too. Yeah. I think so, too. I guess that would be my, I mean, I, I would say it that that would like be the thing. It does look like there's a second sub on the other side of his couch that isn't a cylinder. That's what that looks like. So, oh, I see that blue light there. There's yeah. a blue light there. So, I mean, if that's the case, then... I would re I would place your subs properly. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. Would so be, that would be the big thing I would do. No, I mean, it's yes. perfectly understandable. We can see the challenge, which is that at the now front of his room, uh, he's got his equipment stand in the front left corner, and then the front right corner is like actually an opening to a hallway. So trying yeah. to do diagonally opposite corner placement in this room is, is pretty much an impossibility. Yeah. Um, you know, so then we'd be getting into what what can he do? You sort of diagonally opposite sidewall placement is not yeah. out of the question here because you could sort of have a sub basically uh, sort of in front of that window somewhere, like maybe you know towards the television end of the window that's on the right side wall, and yes. then maybe the cylinder sub can go and live sort of in the uh, you know little bit of wall space that's in between the two couches in the in the corner there. Even though there's doorways there, uh, it could sort of live there. That, it's that type of idea, just getting the subwoofers across the room from 
from each other is is the main type of thing that we would be potentially looking at here. Yeah, I don't I don't see a lot really wrong with this this space. No? I, I would also remind you that you can lie down cylinder subs. You sure uh, can. Because right now your sub is just tall enough that it doesn't fit underneath that little weird shelf yep. that you got on your wall. Yep, yep, yep. So if uh, that is problematic, you can always lie that sub down and mm-hmm. put it, you know, You know, it could go behind the, the couch. Could yeah. Very unobtrusive couch, right. if you did that, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's what we think. But overall, uh, we're giving you a big thumbs up. That's the main I, you thing. You did a good job. That's yes, fine. Yes, we do. Jonathan in the C Den 4.5, he just keeps adding numbers to this no, thing. I mean, I even did that because he, he made some changes to the 4.0, and I'm like, so it's not really the 4.0 anymore, but it wasn't a full spec upgrade to the 5.0, so it's got to be somewhere in between there. All right. Jonathan put a lot of effort into a C Den home theater. He loves it, and he naturally wants to use the best quality source material whenever possible. In his experience, some of the 4K streaming video quality is actually getting pretty darn close to 4K Blu-ray. But on the audio side of things, he doesn't think it's even close. Mm. To him, discs easily sound two to three times better, with the most obvious difference being in the bass. I don't think anybody would disagree with you. Mm. Uh, he's never heard bass from a streaming service that was anything that was anything better than okay, while bass from physical discs often sounds very impressive. He also thinks that clarity, dynamics, and steering of surround sound is superior on discs, and perhaps most of all, with a few notable exceptions, discs seem to be, sound more consistent. He's had streaming services that are all over the place in terms of audio quality. Mm-hmm. That's probably true as well. And I would also say the fact that, at least with discs, there's a modicum of them trying to master to a reference level. Yeah, there is some kind of a standard <laughs> that at least the industry studios know about. They certainly don't follow it with literally every disc. No. But I would generally yes. agree. There, there is would. a greater amount of variance in streaming services yeah. from service to service and from movie to movie within the same service. I, I would was, agree with that. What was I watching the other day? They started talking. Every, at the beginning of the stream of whatever it was, they, they were all out of the right front speaker. And then okay. You heard, you heard somebody like, oh, we messed this up and they pressed the button and all of a sudden they <laughs> popped into the other speaker okay. as well. Just what we want. We're all aware that, that discs offer lossless audio while streams use lo- lossy codecs. There's mm-hmm. the, an obvious objective difference in terms of the audio bit rates, but does that fully explain the huge difference in sound quality between streaming and discs? No. It's been claimed that Dolby Digital Plus is capable of sounding perceptually lossless, and there have been blind listening comparisons where no one could tell Dolby Digital Plus apart from uh, from Dolby True HD. Mm-hmm. But in real world, comparing streaming to discs, it's almost night and day different. So what's going on there? Uh, so the Dolby Digital Plus is, I mean, there's a lot of that. There's a lot of different, it doesn't, it's not a direct, like there's Dolby Digital Plus for this, Dolby Digital Plus for that. You well, know what I mean? It's, it's that the, the bit rate they're allowed to use in Dolby Digital Plus is a huge range, yeah. a huge, yeah. huge range. That said... Um, the bit rate that almost all of the streaming services are using if you are bringing in the Dolby Atmos stream. Because uh, by and large, the Dolby Atmos audio stream on the widest variety of streaming services is pretty consistent. Uh, they're pretty consistent uh, with that bit rate for the Dolby Atmos audio stream. And they've set it right at the level, which is supposed to be like, by all the blind testing comparisons, the minimum bit rate you can get away with on Dolby Digital Plus before people start to readily be able to notice the difference in a blind listing comparison. It's like right at that threshold is what they've chosen uh, for the Dolby Atmos. Now, when you're doing just regular Dolby Digital Plus for 5.1, uh, there can be a huge variation. It can be all yeah. over the place. Um, so this is a case where it's it's it, you, it's an overgeneralization to just say Dolby Digital Plus versus Dolby True HD or you know, lossless DTS, uh, HD master audio, or just uh, uncompressed PCM. Um, Dolby Digital Plus has such variation possible within it that it can be everywhere from, yeah, absolutely perceptually lossless. We, we can prove with data rates that some data was tossed out. Dolby Digital Plus is lossy, but but absolutely would never be able to tell them apart in a blind listening yeah. comparison, all the way down to, you know, the equivalent of really low bitrate MP3 where you can right. easily hear, you know, that that whole variation is possible within Dolby Digital Plus. As and you got to remember that the, the way that these codecs work is they throw out whatever they think you can't hear. And sure. most people don't have access to bass full stop. 
they but just... they also like we've we've seen those documents where they are targeting a different mastering level for the yeah. streaming services, uh, yeah. which is very often a good seven, eight, sometimes even ten or twelve decibels quieter. Uh, certainly than cinema reference level, but yes. even than home reference level, which itself is about six decibels quieter than cinema reference level uh, by and large across the industry. So y- we do have that generally better consistency in discs. There are definitely exceptions, but he's well aware of that. Uh, whereas, yeah, overall, the mastering levels for streaming, if, if they're following those documents, are quieter still. Uh, so that is making a difference there. Because if you've left your volume dial consistent, you're not getting consistent volume oh, yeah. levels. Uh, yeah. that, that's not the thing that's consistent And from at all. show to show, like Disney Plus is a perfect example of that. Sure. Like yeah. they, had that, they had that period of time where everything was mastered to stupidly low levels. And yeah. you know, I was like at... The loudest my AC, my AV receiver's ever been. <laughs> like, I never right. turned it up that loud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all, and then for like um, a year, everything I watched on Disney Plus was at like minus one. Yeah, you know, yeah. trying to get it loud enough for me to to enjoy it. So yeah, but it and is, then now it's kind of back. To it normal. is a bit of a case of uh, very understandable and easy misattribution because. Yeah. Um, Yeah, it's a bit of a shame because Dolby Digital Plus does not have to mean, it does not inherently mean a degradation in sound quality. Uh, it's, It's one of those cases where people are saying, okay, the majority of the time that I listen to something via streaming that's coming in Dolby Digital Plus, I can notice that it sounds worse than the lossless version on the disc, but it's not really cause and effect. There's some correlation going on here, but right. it's a case of correlation not being causation in this instance, uh, because Dolby Digital Plus does not inherently have to sound any worse at all. So I think there was a bit of a thing, because I know Jonathan had a bit of a back and forth with uh, the HT guys, are and Braden as well, um, because they were, they were referring to when they were at Sony and they were hearing some of the early tests of Dolby Digital Plus and like Dolby Digital Plus it can be amazing <laughs> they yeah. were like but we were listening to it versus losses and couldn't hear any difference so you know from that point of view it's like yeah they're absolutely right it can sound that good the, the yeah. format is not limited to sounding worse but in real world are we getting worse sounding we're definitely getting quieter that like that and that's a thing again that's a choice that's not inherent to the codec the codec isn't right. forcing it to be quieter they're saying because it's streaming because we assume it's being played through TV speakers or a sound bar we're, we're going gonna make it quieter for whatever reason which is a little bit weird you gotta you gotta think too i mean as far as uh what choices they're making uh, in in the algorithms you know what you don't want to do is introduce distortion into the audio that's what they're trying to avoid most of all so that they if they're limiting the bass that's why Mm -hmm. because that's what's gonna cause when it comes out of tv speakers or a sound bar farting away it's just gonna be farting like crazy and people are like what's happened to my tv my tv's broken i was watching this and now my tv's broken you know it's not broken nerd change the channel will be fine (laughs) but uh yes there's a lot of things that that go on in this and because true hd and dts master audio are more limited in, in in a way in that they're like this is it you get, yeah, you get all the, fixed <laughs> yeah they're fixed at this bit rate yeah. you're like you know that you've got all this to work with right. so they use it all as yeah. opposed to dolby digital plus which is like you know this is mp3 crap and mm-hmm. this is basically lossless yeah. you know but it, it can be anywhere in the middle of there yeah uh it, it, it means you don't actually know what you're getting yeah no yeah. dan First up, can we direct him to the white paper by Harmon we often reference that explains proper subwoofer placement and alignment in an enclosed room? And there's a Harmon paper. You can search for that, the Harmon white paper. You can, but sir. You can we search will, for We will have it. We'll yes. have the links in yeah, the show we'll have, we'll have the links in our show notes. But yes, if you search for Harmon multiple subwoofers, uh, yeah. Just in Google, that will that will definitely That'll bring up the there. PDF written by Todd Welty. There, uh, there is uh, an expansion on that where he was largely focusing on room shape and this whole thing about you know square rooms being bad. He's like, no, you can get around square rooms as long as you use more than one subwoofer. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. have to be terrible, even in a uh, basically cube shaped room. So there is an expansion to that. There's a PDF for that as well. We'll have the link for that as well. And then there is additional if you just want more reading on the subject and to go a different route of using multiple subwoofers to address room modes and uniformity across a wider seating area in a method that is different from what Todd Welty has uh, studied and written up for Harman uh, than the multi-sub optimizer uh, software that you can download for free. There's a whole like 
reading section about how it works and how to adjust it and that approach of having independent level and timing and EQ independent per subwoofer and using two, three, or four subwoofers uh, in the multi-sub optimizer method of doing it. Uh, so that is, you know, that's not something you can do manually. That's not something you can do trial and error. You have to have a computer crunch those numbers for you. Uh, whereas right. the Harman Todd Welty version, you don't necessarily need to crunch numbers. It's not a sheer brute force calculated version of doing it. It is using geometry more than anything. And, uh, you know, just the way that uh, fluids work, fluid dynamics work, uh, given the certain shape of a room. So two different approaches there, but we'll have the links to all of those. So you came across JL Audio's write-up that describes basically step-by-step -step their suggested process for adjusting and aligning the phase of one or two subwoofers with the front, left, and right speakers in the stereo setup. Mm -hmm. They begin by telling you to set the crossover frequency between your main speakers and subwoofer or subwoofers, and they only warn to do this in one place. So bypass the subwoofer's built-in crossover controls if you're using receiver's base management, or send full range signal to, from the receiver and adjust the crossover controls built into the sub itself, but only do one or the other. Yep, we're on board with that. That's that. That's fine. We yes. got no problems with that. Don't do the cascading crossover nonsense. Yeah. Yep. We talk about that quite a bit. Then they have you level match the subwoofer to whichever main speaker is closest to it. That. Okay. <laughs> what? <laughs> we're outie already. <laughs> <laughs> we tried. We tried. We tried. We tried. We did. Yes. We listened. We listened to what they had to say, and then they started saying stupid stuff, so we stopped listening. <laughs> if you're using two subwoofers, subwoofers, they want you to level match a left sub to the front left speaker, the right sub to the front right speaker, and they say to just use trial and error moving the subwoofer's volume dial up and down, playing a test tone that falls right within the crossover frequency range until the level of the tone seems to be coming equally from the speaker and the subwoofer. What a terrible idea. Yeah, it's going to be... It's That's gonna be, be real hard to do by ear. Yeah, how sure are your is. how are your how are your golden ears? Because I've been doing this for twenty years, and my golden ears aren't that good. And especially the folks who are like, I want my crossover as low as I can possibly put it, so oh, they yeah, have it down there at uh, sixty hertz, 60 fifty hertz, hertz, forty hertz, forty hertz. Yeah. Good luck telling when that changed from subwoofer to speaker. Plus, it's more or less implied that you have as close to co-located co your subwoofers and yes. speakers as you can. It That's be right certainly there. the yeah, it, they don't say that explicitly, but it's certainly implied. Yeah. Lastly, they make a somewhat interesting suggestion. I was already interested mm. in what they were suggesting. They want you to start with the subwoofer's polarity and phase knobs set, out, set to zero degrees, and they want you to reverse the speaker wire going out of your main speaker so that black to red, red to black, with a test tone that falls within the crossover frequency range still playing, they want you to slowly turn the phase knob of your subwoofer until you create a null or as little output which is, of course, the maximum cancellation, as you can. Mm -hmm. Now, put the speaker wire back the way it should be, black to black, red to red, and they said you should have ideal phase alignment. Do the process over again for the other main speaker and subwoofer if you're using two subs, and as one would imagine, they also have you do this with the, the left and right surround speakers if you're using four subs as a multi-channel setup mm -hmm. for quadraphonic sound. Yep. Uh, since they want you to be sitting in your primary seat when you make these adjustments on your subwoofer, they suggest having a friend help out, and they note that you might need to readjust the volume level of the sub again at the very end after having adjusted the phase. What do we think of this procedure? Can we explain to him the thought process behind it, and should he follow it? Well, okay. I Last thing first, no, no, don't follow it. <laughs> don't do that. That's the simple first answer. Of all. Short answer. <laughs> so let's go you'll read the Harmon papers, and they'll tell you yep. not to do that. Mm -hmm. So we're not telling you. Go argue with Todd Welty. Um <laughs> And then uh, what's the thought process behind it? Uh, they are trying to recreate the idea of having a, um, as far as the phase thing, you got me. That I'm sure that makes sense to somebody. Uh, maybe it makes sense to Rob and he'll explain it to you, but it doesn't make any sense to me. What they're <laughs> trying to do is create a full range speaker. Yes. Is what they're trying to do. So they want your, you want stereo subs or quadraphonic subs, mm -hmm. each one matched to a speaker mm -hmm. so that the, the, the the volume level of the, the the subwoofer, which by the way is different completely, like the the way that the bass comes out of that thing is not the same way the treble comes out of the speaker. Right. So that this treble is directional and the bass is filling the entire room. <laughs> so how are you really level matching these things? that well well Anyways. i mean they're trying to match it to the low end of the speaker so the low end of the speaker is fixed because it doesn't have a volume knob yeah. so you know trying to match the output of the subwoofer that you've added which is self-powered so that those two things match up going all the way in reverse so we said should you follow it no what can we explain the process they're trying to make full range speakers yeah so and turn it 
turn a two-way speaker into a three-way speaker by yeah. adding a self-powered subwoofer on the bottom end or a three-way speaker into a four-way speaker. But that is not that is nothing new, right? The no. notion that the quote-unquote ideal would be full range speakers in every position and not having subwoofers or the subwoofers that you have only play the dedicated low frequency effects channel. That is old school thinking. Yeah. It would work in a wide open field with no walls around you. That would function. Yes. But we do have walls. The rooms we have in our homes are small acoustic spaces, uh, you know, less than 55 feet in every direction <laughs> is is almost a certainty in most of our houses. And uh, yeah, so it, it's old school thinking. It's not mysterious where that notion came no. from, uh, but it's just not the way that we would do things. Well, and okay, there's, a, there's, there's two things, you know, first of all, you sell more subs by telling people to, that they need four of them. Okay, mm -hmm. you just do. That's just the way this works. Second of all, tell me you don't have a remote control for your subwoofer without telling me you don't have a remote control for your sure. subwoofer because you don't have to have a friend if you have an SVS sub. That's, That's all right. I gotta say. You can be a loner and still <laughs> do this stupid process for no, you know, whatever. But also, um, remember the audience. Okay, mm -hmm. they're not talking to you. They are talking to people who already think that this is how things should work because it's sure. how things have always worked and they're done learning. And I, while I don't want to ever be that person, I certainly know enough of them to know that it's not malicious or anything like that. They just mm -hmm. have, this is the way that things have always been done. It's worked for them in the past. And why would they, if something keeps, if something works, why change it? So but this I is also, how they believe. Full on getting to the meat of this, I full on disagree with that idea of uh, adjusting the phase in this way. Because yeah. what they've done, so th what they were explaining is that if you do the uh, reverse the polarity of the speaker wire, so red to black, black to red, and then actually adjust the phase on the subwoofer and listen for the null to form, the, the maximum cancellation, and then put the speaker wire back together, what you have done is found the point at which the output of the speaker and the output of the subwoofer are doubling up they're now yeah. forming the biggest hump the, that they can possibly form, which is not phase alignment. That's not proper phase alignment. Proper phase alignment would be that you don't have a massive hump or dip when the two sides of the cross, because what, you, what you're creating is a crossover. It's a crossover between the bottom end of the speaker and the top end of the subwoofer. And you don't want them to meet where they completely cancel out or completely double up. You want them 90 degrees from that so that they merge together at a even level, not a doubling up or a canceling out level. So I 100% disagree with the notion that you're going to listen until you have a null, then inverse the polarity so that you've created a double up. That's horrible. I would never want to do that. Don't do this. It will make it, it will give you, and I think this is the reason that they're doing this, it will give you a more kick you in the chest. Well, I mean, bass. whatever the crossover frequency is, you've got if you're around stupidly loud bass right there. Yeah. You're gonna have you're gonna, have, you're gonna have a, you're gonna have a nice hump. Else. <laughs> you're gonna have a nice hump there. That's gonna sound it's a bad way of doing this. Yeah. Anyways, it's very dumb. Don't do it. Just do no. it the what we tell you to do it. Uh, what is up with the seemingly poor longevity and or quality control of plate amps? It might just be anecdotal. It is. <laughs> but he's been into audio for decades, and it sure seems as though, if anything, it's going to die. If anything is going to die in the audio system during just normal use, it's the plate amp, typically Class D, built into a subwoofer or a powered tower tower speaker. Mm -hmm. Compared to the amps built into AV receivers or standalone stereo multi-channel amps, he's noticed a much, much higher failure rate. So why is that? What makes plate amps fail so often? Um we used to talk about Vizio a lot before they okay. got sold to Walmart. And one of the things that I used to say is I, I, I talked to delivery driver one time. He was dropping off a TV for me to review. It was a Samsung uh, plasma. That's how long ago that review was. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, he, we were talking about Vizio. He's like, Oh, I pick up more Vizios than anybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, those things are garbage. You know, of course, he was said some racist stuff on top of that too. But oh, basically, what he said was it's garbage from a country that's that he didn't like. And I was like, well, they sell more TVs <laughs> than anything else. I guess, but I mean, are are, are actually there are more high powered subwoofers out there than there are AV receivers? Like, I don't know. I think that uh, there's plate. Plate amps are ubiquitous. They are in yeah. so many things that it's hard for me. And then not only that, they're often in things that are very high powered. Like your yeah. AV receiver, 
as many watts as it wants to claim really isn't pushing out that many watts mm-hmm. all that often. Whereas your your subwoofer amp is mm-hmm. actually putting out quite a bit of power. And I think there's something to the, uh, you know, like there's plenty of small sealed subwoofers out there. It's just the heat that's building up in there. Uh, very often to bring the uh, weight down as low as they can, that power supply is kind of minimal. Um, we used to see that a lot. I mean, it's one of the reasons why bash amplifiers became yeah. a big deal because they were a lot more reliable than a lot of the plate amps that we had prior to the bash amplifiers. There was a much lower failure rate once bash came around. Um, What's the cheapest AV receiver you can find when you're talking about that? mm. And then, you know, with how much, how much of that money is being spent on amps versus what's the cheapest subwoofer you can find Mm -hmm. with a plate amp in it? (laughs) I mean, that plate amp costs pennies. Right. A lot of the times. Yeah, I think that's about it. I think it's power supply. I think it's heat. I think it's the amount of wattage that is being called for on a regular basis. So, yeah, yeah I, I I do think some of it is anecdotal, but I don't entirely disagree, right? Like, I've probably come across more dead subwoofer amplifiers than I have dead AV receiver amplifiers. If something's going to die in an AV receiver, it's usually the HDMI board, and that's heat related again. So, yeah. if it's anything, I think it's that. I think I think subwoofers get pushed a lot harder than AV receivers yeah. do, just in yeah. general. I think people tend to to, to run their base a lot hotter. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we'd really like us to revisit, maybe dig a bit deeper in the topic of speakers that are essentially as good as you could ever need them to be. Hmm. What's on this mind is that there are so many speakers out there at wildly different price points. And while there might not be such a thing as a literally perfect speaker, hmm. I mean, other than mine. <laughs> it... <laughs> of course. Why else would I have them if they weren't perfect? <laughs> stupid. Don't be a stupid Because you got them at a person. discount. That's why. That's... Oh, that's right. <laughs> It makes sense to him that, that there's a point of diminishing returns and at some point that the only thing you're paying for more is looks or purely just marketing or a name or hype or aesthetics. Oh, you said looks. He said looks. Uh, if you do as much as you reasonably can to treat your room and make it good, uh, a good acoustic environment, how do you know when you've gotten speakers that basically sound as good as they're going to get? Just an example, we thought SVS's Ultra, line, Ultra series of speakers already sounded damn good, but now they've discontinued those and replaced them with the more expensive Ultra Evolution series, mm-hmm. which sounds like a Dragon Ball It sure series. does. Uh, will they actually sound that much better c- commensurate with the price increase in price or have we already entered the realm of diminishing returns even though SVS's ultra series speakers are far far less expensive than a lot of the other speaker options that are out there how do you decide when to stop how do you determine where to draw that line that says spending more on this isn't buying me any further sonic improvement well I mean we've talked about this a ton and uh, I think getting 90% of anywhere other than like when you're flying in a plane, <laughs> getting 90% <laughs> of, the, of the way to a place mm-hmm. uh, uh, of, of achievement or of performance is good enough in almost all the cases. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't need to be the fastest cyclist on the planet. I could, I'm not even close to being the fastest cyclist on the planet. I mean, I, if I'm hitting, if I'm 50%, that's fine. I'm, I'd be happy as clam. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the bike I'm riding, I would like it to be, to have, as much performance as possible so that I know that the limiting factor is not the bike. It's me. I see. Okay. Same thing with the speakers in my, in my system. Okay. But, and, and you kind of touched on this, you kind of danced around it. Like, Oh, if you made your room good. Okay. That's not, you kind of off, you kind of hand wave that away. That's the big deal. Okay. <laughs> yeah. That's if not you, a given. Of course. If you want to make, if you want to experience the difference in more expensive speakers, like really experience mm-hmm. it, the room acoustics, or a massive part of that. But there there also isn't a singular perfect acoustic room because we no. don't have a standard like that. No. Uh, Dolby, for their mastering suites, gives you a range. They're like, be in this range for RT60 times, be in this range for the frequency response, but it's a range. And that's, yeah. that's one company's specification. It's a pretty widely used specification, especially across the movie industry, but it's a range still. And you go from mastering suite to mastering suite and they don't sound identical just in yeah. their acoustics, let alone what speakers they might be using, which also could be different and affect the so there isn't like a singular, this is actually some sort of objective perfection because we don't have a standard like that for audio. We have a standard pretty darn close to that for video. And you can get really close to saying like, this yeah. is objectively what it's supposed to be. But audio, there's this whole range. So there is no like perfect you can absolutely reach. But I've I've talked about my approach before, which is like, I think it's relatively easy to uh, know that 
by spending more on a speaker, you're actually getting more sound because simply by playing a full frequency range sweep, you can be like, this speaker is very clearly rolling off the high frequencies and this speaker that cost a little bit more is not. And it's pretty easy to be like, yep, I spent a bit more money and I got more yes. sound out of this speaker. Then I get to, you hit this point where it flips around. It's like, there is no more sound to get out of this speaker because we've reached the limits of human hearing. Maybe there is a speaker that plays even higher and even lower, but I can't hear it, so who cares? I've reached the limits of what a speaker can do in terms of delivering more sound for the money. Now I get to actually spending a little bit more money to get less sound from the speaker in the form of faster transient response and lower distortion. Those things are absolutely diminishing returns. Once you've hit the, there is no more sound I need to get out of a speaker uh, for more money, it, you've, you've hit diminishing returns. You've hit uh, maybe Maybe I can measure a slightly faster transient response, but it gets really, really difficult to be able to actually hear that in a blind comparison. Maybe I can get lower. So we know we can get lower distortion, but it's right. really hard to hear that. And yeah. so we're 100 percent into diminishing return territory once we got there. And you don't have to spend crazy amounts no. of money to reach that point. You don't have to go super duper expensive. So to my mind, it's like. Can you push it any further? Technically, of course, there is no such thing as a literally perfect speaker that does exactly what the signal said. Uh, everything has inertia. <laughs> there is a physical material moving back and forth. So you're never going to get it to literally stop exactly when this, uh, the signal said to. There's going to be some form of distortion here or there. And, and that even if is you can get something like an electrostatic speaker, which is about as fast as a driver. But even be. then, it's not literally perfect. Yeah, and so, but, but it's academic, have, right? They have other point. problems too. Those yeah. speakers are not going to be sure. linear down to 20 hertz. You know, getting getting any lower distortion becomes an, an academic pursuit, not something that yeah. you could actually hear in a blind comparison. And you reach that level pretty darn quickly. So, I mean, comparing like SVS Ultra, we haven't heard Ultra Evolution, we don't know for sure. It's That's more about... They bought up parts for years and years. They did their fa manufacturing runs and they had the Ultra Series. They reached a point where it's like, well, either it's going to cost us more money to keep going with the same points or we can transition to a new series, get a new series of parts going here. And of course, due to inflation, we're going to increase price. So we're going to make some changes and we're going to market it as it being an improvement over what we used to have because nobody wants to move backwards. Everybody wants to move forwards and we want to get more expensive and maintain our margins and inflation is a real thing. And all of those are like business business decisions, not necessarily performance decisions. I wouldn't anticipate that in a true blind listening test, you're going to have some wild difference yeah, between the Ultra either. and the Ultra Evolution. Um, you know, so th I mean, that's that's expectation on my part. It, that's yeah. not having listened to it, but it's a pretty reasonable, educated guess given everything that's going on uh, and our experience in the past listening things. So yeah, if you're worried, like, do I have to get to some point and then I'm going to be confident that there's nowhere else to go? There's always somewhere else to go because there's always a difference you could hear. And you might prefer or not like that difference. And that's a purely subjective thing. You can absolutely get speakers at all kinds of different price points that sound different from each other. But if you're trying to say this is the perfect speaker that doesn't exist, uh, there isn't even a standard we can point you to that says objectively, this is exactly what it should do. But yeah. we can point at an electrical signal and say, has this reasonably converted that electrical signal to kinetic movement uh, in a way that that follows analogously very close to the same lines, whether we're looking at it on an oscilloscope in electrical form or measuring it with a microphone and seeing it in acoustic form do those two lines basically overlap once we've done that you know in time domain as well you know uh, factoring in for uh, 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 transient response and impulse response well then we we can be quite confident that yeah this speaker is telling it like it is that this is what the signal said to do that's what the speaker did and yeah you can get that uh, you know, at, at price, like per listen would absolutely do that and probably doesn't have to cost that as much. The difference between the, the S series and the R series, kind of academic, kind of unnecessary. The lower priced ones already does everything that you could really want a speaker to do. Uh, uh, and that's about it. You know, what Ascend is doing with uh, their Sierra series speakers and, and doing it with those clipable measurements and that. It's like, you don't really have to go much more expensive than that unless you just want to go louder. So yeah, that's yeah. kind of the limit. I, I think that... Um... A lot of people, what they run up against, like I said, to, to start with is the room, you know, so mm -hmm. they get speakers that are as good as they can sound in their room and then yeah. they have to address the room and their room gets better and they go, oh, these speakers don't sound as good as I remember them spending the sounding. They start hearing the problems with them yeah. and then they can upgrade their speakers to a certain point where 
they're like, okay, I can't hear any, like it, spending more money is not, I'm not going to hear any more differences That's right. in that. That's right. And then they have to either, and then at some point the room gets about as good as it's going to get. Yep. And then you're like, and then you get to the point where you do but get You that, could make that, it deader or you could make it yeah. more reflective, but it's not but you better. It's just different. Different, right. And like Rob said, there is a, there's a lot that goes into preference in speakers, and oh, it's yeah. not just it's not just this is objectively the best speaker out there. It is this is the I don't hear linearly because I've got no, we don't. hearing damage here and there, and you know, or We're just whatever. inherently humans don't hear linearly. <laughs> and my room, it, it doesn't exactly affect the the even no matter how much I treat it, doesn't affect the sound exactly the same way. So mm. it is perfectly reasonable to think that you could have a very well treated room you could you know have very well placed speakers you could mm-hmm. have them you know very high quality very expensive speakers and listen to them in your room and go these are the best in the world and yeah. then you could take those same speakers to another well treated room set mm-hmm. them up properly and go ah i don't like them anymore <laughs> that's it's a perfectly- little unlikely honestly if yeah. you're at that level but it's a possibility it's possible sure. Ryan. Ryan says, is there any benefit to putting some sort of isolation pads under bookshelf speakers that are on yes. speaker stands? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> it depends. I mean, technically it depends, but yeah, yeah almost right. yes. Yeah. If so, should those isolation pads go in between the speakers themselves and the top of the speaker stands? Should they go between the bottom of the speaker stands and the floor or both? Well, if the floor is hard, both. If the floor is carpet, then just between the speaker stand and the the, I mean, it's the it's more important to put the what, what we're talking about is a shock absorber. Yes. That's what it is. It's more important to the, put the shock absorber in between the thing that is physically vibrating and the thing that it is sitting on. So, the, if you're going to put it in one place, put it between the bottom of the speaker and whatever the speaker is sitting on, because yes. the speaker is the thing that is physically vibrating. Yes. That's what you want to physically isolate from whatever it's sitting on. So that's the number one place to put it. And yes, yes, do it. <laughs> because yes. those physical vibrations will transmit into whatever the speaker is sitting on. That goes for subwoofers. That goes for tower speakers, too. You want to decouple them or damp them. You want to put a, a shock absorber in between the vibrating thing and the non-vibrating thing. Otherwise, the non-vibrating thing starts vibrating. Yes. So my speakers have a uh, museum putty between yeah. them and the uh, the stand that they're on. Mm-hmm. And then the stand is sitting on top of apparently extremely thick carpet and carpet, carpet pad. pad. Yeah. And I don't have any spikes or anything on the bottom. I just yeah. took off the feet. They just and so the chance flat. of that speaker vibration getting into the structure of your building, low Zero. because you are well <laughs> damped. Yes. Uh, and my my subwoofers all have the, uh, the feet on them. The yeah. The sound path isolation feet. If you want to help visualize your audio with some graphs and you just want to do it on on all on your Android phone, is there an app we can recommend? Free would be great, but he's willing to pay if we think there's an Android app that's worth it. Yep. Okay, so tell him I don't know what it is. Yeah, for Android, it's just called Audio Tool. All one word, no space between those, but Audio Tool. It is not free, it is $8. So I don't think that's some kind of ridiculous, unreasonable price to pay. It's got a lot of nice functionality. I didn't notice in the write-up for it, because I haven't used it because I don't have an Android phone, I uh, I didn't notice an FFT, a fast Fourier transform, mm. uh, but they do just have a real-time analyzer on there with pretty decent 1 12th octave resolution, which is absolutely perfectly fine for just visualizing what's going on uh, in your system if you use that. Uh, it does also have RT60 times, which is great great because one thing I definitely want to be able to chart uh, are my decay times. That That's a huge part of why I'm going to be putting acoustic treatments and how I'm going to determine if I need more or less acoustic treatments in my room is the decay times more than the frequency response. So given that you've got real-time analyzer at 1 12th octave for sure, that's definitely mentioned in there, and uh, RT60 graphs as well, I'm like, yeah, that's the two most important things that I want to have. Do I like to have a fast Fourier transform to look at instead of an RTA? Do I like to have a waterfall graph to look at instead of an RT60? Sure. 
sure, those are niceties, but I don't need them to do what I need to do in terms of looking at charts. Uh, so that has what you need for eight bucks. Now, uh, it is probably recommended to not just use the microphone that's built into your phone for taking the measurements. Uh, you know, Android phones can uh, vary wildly and audio tools doesn't necessarily know what microphone you're using, so it can't really compensate uh, right. consistently. And a lot of Android microphones are not full range, so the bass uh, measurements be way out of whack and the trouble might be out of whack too because they're focused on capturing your voice, which is understandable for a phone. So highly recommended is Dayton's IMM6. It's a little microphone, uh, and it actually uses a headphone jack attachment. So with today's phones, you'll probably need a dongle to plug it into the USB port on the bottom of your phone, but you can absolutely get one of those USB-C to uh, headphone jack dongles. That's no problem. Uh, and of course, you want the one that would work with a headset because it is a microphone that you're inputting, not headphones. Uh, so that goes for $21.50 from Parts Express, so it costs more than the app, but it is right. well worth it. And they provide with it a calibration file for that microphone that you just bought, and you can input that into audio tools. It has a place to put that uh, specifically for the Dayton IMM6 uh, calibration file to, to just import that little uh, calibration file and, and off you go. You can get very decent usable results with that and for under 30 bucks, right? $29.50. So I think that's pretty reasonable to be able to do all that. So he's interested in AP comparing two pairs of different speakers, but obviously seems terribly flawed to physically unplug one pair of speakers and plug in the other pair when trying to switch back and forth mm. for the comparison. Don't you have any friends? Yeah, friends. <laughs> Even so, not Even fast so, enough. it's it's a pain. Yeah, I know. Yes. I've done it. So how do we suggest setting things up to allow as close an instantaneous switch between two pairs of speakers as possible? Mm -hmm. All right. So a couple of ways. There's a couple of ways here, but Rob and Rob's going to go through. One of the things that he's going to talk about, but sure, uh, you know, you can use the speaker A B in your A B A B receiver if a lot it of has times, them. If it has yeah. that, in my case, I got it on the amp that clicks, so you know, sure. it's right there. But yeah, but, many A B receivers do allow you to set front speakers A and front speakers B. Usually, they'll commandeer the surround back binding posts to yeah. become your your front B pair of speakers, and then you can switch between whether speaker A is on or speaker B is on. That, that's yeah. a way to do it. Uh. I will say, just in general, mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. And we, and in fact, we talked about earlier. The guy asked if if the spe if the uh, pre outs are um, hot the same time that the, sure. the thing on. You can do it that way too. You know, I mean, it, you have to un unplug the speaker still, but it's not like you you have to be super. Um, uh, you can turn the amp on, on and off. You know, right. Two amps. The, pre, the way the, I did it was two amps. You know, I, sure. I, I, I split yeah. it, yeah, yeah, and then yeah. just two different amps. Uh, yeah. But you could theoretically you could do it that way. Yeah, use the speaker binding post for one, and then the yeah. amp for the other, and then you'd have to unplug them, but it'd be a lot faster. Mm -hmm. I will say that I feel like people get way too worried about switching instantaneously, um, oh. and, and I understand why. Mm -hmm. uh, but remember that what we really want to hear between when we're comparing two speakers, should not be differences so small that well, we cannot hear them. That's you and I, Tom, though. That's you and I. We've come, we've been at this long enough. I'm like, telling you. Wait a second. <laughs> as, as, as a person who has been doing this for a long time, yes. it does not matter if one is slightly better than the other oh, one. Oh, but so many people believe that it does I, matter, Tom. I did we, run an article that's called "If Everybody Who Says That Their 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 Speaker Their 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 System Upgrade or Maybe Speaker Upgrade Is Slightly Better Is a Liar." Yeah, because yeah. It, it, they're just they're going to keep listening till they hear something. What you sure. really want to hear are the major differences, and you will hear them no matter if there's a a a, a, a instantaneous switch or a one minute switch. You oh, will hear, to it. hear the minuscule differences, Tom. No. See, see. I mean, I t I talked about this when uh, one of those weeks when you were away, and I I, I talked with Lee. Right? There's this. There's this pervasive assumption yeah. we come across all the time in audio, any audio circles, any of the audio forums, all of it, that there is a difference. That's the assumption. The assumption is there is a difference, yeah. and you just need to formulate the test and your listening properly to detect it. And I'm like, wait a second. Why? Why is that the assumption? Why is the starting point, well, there's got to be a difference. Why isn't the assumption, there probably isn't a difference. There's probably yeah. no detectable difference. Remember the room. We just <laughs> talked about this. You're not, if you can't hear the difference because of your room, then there's no difference. Sure. 
There's no I mean, it's objective, just, it's just a subjective difference. It's a it's a mindset reset. I'm yeah. like the the baseline assumption, the null hypothesis should be there's no whatever difference. things we're comparing. There's no difference. That's yeah, the that's, that's the, the baseline. Yeah. You have to disprove that, not the other way around. You're not trying you to find the difference. You're trying to <laughs> try try. You're you're assuming that there is no difference, but yeah. you're gonna ch- you're gonna listen anyways, just in case there is. Sure. But that difference should not be. It it, it shouldn't be minor. It should be. Right. But yeah, that said, uh, you know, if we're into the scenario where somebody just wants to do this, there could be absolutely legitimate reasons to compare uh, two pairs of speakers. So that's fine. And let's say you do not have pre-outs, so you can't do the two amplifier thing and uh, turn one off, turn one on. And you do not have speakers A and speakers B, because not all AV receivers offer that. Uh, there is just a nice external box. There's actually a really nice one on offer now for $80. Uh, the brand is Solu Peak which I don't really know, but the Salu Peak P3 for 80 bucks is uh, two speaker, uh, like two pairs of speaker wire in and two pairs of speaker wire out with just passive dip switches, metallic connection switches, which is exactly what we want. There's no yeah. possible degradation of the signal quality going through here. So you can just connect your single amplifier out left and right uh, speaker wire connection from your AV receiver, one pair of binding posts to amp A, and then switch between speakers A and speakers B being driven by that amp. There is no way to use this switch box to drive both pairs of speakers simultaneously. Um, that you, you cannot do that. This is a selector. So you're using one amplifier or or the other, you're using one pair of speakers or the other, not both at the same time in either scenario, but that's exactly what we want for a comparison. So for 80 bucks, that's a pretty reasonable solution. They do mention it's uh, 100 watts RMS as the recommended uh, you know, sustained power or 200 watt peaks for uh, short peak duration. So there is sort of a power limit that they're suggesting on there, suggesting there's some fairly uh, thin, skinny uh, wires inside of this thing. <laughs> it's not handling all oodles and oodles of power, but for, yeah, just comparing two pairs of speakers that could get it done. Uh, he says, let's say you have a 10 band, 10 band graphic EQ with fixed frequency points that you can adjust up and down. Could we explain or point to a website or chart that explains which instruments will be impacted by which frequency bands? So we talked last week that I had a, um, article that called, uh, why subwoofer extension is important. Okay. And in that is a graphic that shows where all like, not all, but many of the instruments are. Sure. And, and it shows the the range, so you can go look at that. There's similar uh, charts uh, outside of AV Gadget. Sweetwater has a nice one, and one of the things in Sweetwater's that's kind of nice is uh, they. Uh, throw in a bunch of these subjective terms that a lot of people often use, you know, yeah. like air or presence or warmth or body, Whatever. you know, those type of... But I mean, I kind of like that. I kind of like yeah. that. Like, if somebody is mentioning that t- type of term, this is probably the frequency range that they're talking about. Not necessarily, because none of that is standardized in some no. sort of codified a lot of way. just talking out of their butts. A lot of times way. they're just pulling it out of their rear and saying whatever they subjectively feel. But this is kind of cool that Sweetwater has these subjective terms mapped to frequency range. Just so I like that. We'll have the link for Sweetwater's one as well. And then there's another very comprehensive graph that I also like, which does a good job of um, comparing all of these other vocal ranges or instruments to where they fall on a standard 88 key piano and having the frequency uh, ranges listed there as well. So different ways of, you know, organizing this, but absolutely uh, you can, you know, have a way of uh, saying, yep, yeah, what, what frequency range are we talking about when we're talking about this instrument? And there are charts for that. We'll have at least links to three different options for that. Jay, Jay, Jay recently asked us for relatively inexpensive wireless Bluetooth earphone su- uh, suggestions that uh, he could use when he's at the gym since his mm-hmm. J-Lab Go Air Sport. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the name. <laughs> that's what it is. There's nothing it I can hurts, do about it. it. It hurts my soul to have to say such a stupid name. A uh, pair he had picked up were constantly... They were constantly dropping their signal, both with yeah. his phone and with a standalone scan, uh, sand disc music player. He got mm-hmm. to wondering, could the codec he's, he's using be responsible for the dropouts? No. Some of the music files are in FLAC, some are MP3s, other in AAC. He came across some posts online that saying to convert everything to AAC for the most reliable performance. But could certain Bluetooth headphones have issues with MP3 specifically or with FLAC? I don't, I don't see no. why. 
No, the uh, like the codec your decoding phone converts everything into whatever, and then it's sent out via Bluetooth. It's not like that's that. right. Yeah, Bluetooth is uh, in a way its own codec, right? Like we talk about aptX uh, at Bluetooth. Yeah. That is a Bluetooth codec, and if you don't have aptX, there's some other Bluetooth codec. So the phone or the SanDisk player, it is decoding whatever the format might be, be that FLAC or AAC or MP3. It's decoding that, and then it is re-encoding it into one of the Bluetooth formats before it gets sent out so unless the player or the phone is having some i mean that still wouldn't be responsible for the bluetooth dropout you yeah, might yeah. get a, a glitch in the audio if there's something wrong with the decoding and i think you have process. a bad antenna as well yeah think. no i i think those and i not we're not even blaming the j lab go air sport as a model of earphones we're saying yeah. the exact unit that you got yeah, was exactly. ha, had a problem with you it that's unlucky. what we think but yeah it wasn't it's not the codec that you're using to play back there's no issue with that in terms of bluetooth dropouts JR, we commented on JR's gorgeous basement home theater last week when he asked about getting more slam mm-hmm. from his pair of SVS PC 2000 Pro cylinder subs, and we thought we might have spotted a Denon receiver in the system. That's true. He's using a Denon X3700H to do all of the processing for his immersive audio home theater system. Mm-hmm. Mine's immersive too. Immersively clicks. It's extra. It's That's true. Feature. But it is immersive audio. You do have an Atmos setup. That counts. And he also has a Macintosh Mac, MAC, I guess. Yes. I, I guess I, can, I have to say MAC. MAC 7200 two-channel receiver that he uses instead of a Denon when he's just listening to two-channel music. It has theater bypass units. So when he's using the Denon for the home theater, the Macintosh just becomes a two-channel amplifier for his front for left and right speakers. And one thing he didn't mention last week is that for immersive, immersive audio in home theater, he just uses the Denon's bass management, and he honestly has no complaints about the bass in that scenario. There's no lack of punch or slam during movies or the occasional spatial audio music tracks he might listen to. Uh-huh. That's, I think I'm spotting I think a I very out what easy your problem. solution here. <laughs> I wrote an article about this, too. <laughs> I bought this very expensive two-channel integrated amp for the specific and sole purpose of listening to two-channel music. It always sounds worse than when I listen to my surround sound system, Weird. but it has to be better. I spent all the money be. on it. But when he's using it just the Macintosh with the den turned off, he also has a Mac uh, Macintosh MEN220 Room Perfect two-channel room correction system that handles the bass management and EQ. Mm-hmm. And it's when that system is in use that he feels he's missing some slam from kick drums and bass guitars. Mm. I love it when you get like part of the story and then you give the answer and then they're like, oh, well, I didn't tell you like all the important <laughs> relative details that you would need to know in order to answer the question correctly. <laughs> MEN220 can adjust the target curve, but he's never actually tried using that feature before. We said last week that you could do some fairly simple EQ adjustments right in the SVS's uh, cylinder subs themselves. And he is familiar with the SVS app already, so that seemed like a promising solution to him, but no, not no, don't do right? that now. Don't do that now, because now it's going to mess up your, your home theater That's exactly experience. what he's asking about. <laughs> but if he goes and adjusts the EQ in the SVS subs themselves so that his two-channel music s- sounds more pleasing to him, will that mess up the way his movies and multi-channel music sounds when he's using the Denon instead? Yes, it will. Would it be best for him to figure out the Macintosh MEN 220's curve editor and leave the EQ and the SVS subs themselves alone? Yes, that's what exactly you should do. Or just stop using stop all that. Stop using the but Macintosh equipment. You're like, man, everything's. I know you really- don't want to. That's not what you want to hear. <laughs> no, of course but not. But it's so funny to me. It's like, I've got this one thing that sounds really good, but I yep. got this other thing that's supposed to sound better, but it sounds worse. Yeah. yeah. Let, let, me, let me just. I'm just going to throw something crazy out there. Uh. Just try listening to shoot channel stuff on your Denon and see how it sounds. Mm. Just by itself. Yeah. With no the, you can leave, or anything? You, you leave the other things in, in line or whatever they're doing, right? Mm-hmm. When they just, just like you were listening to multi channel, yes. except put on something that's stereo and change the listening mode to stereo. Yeah, mode. so the the Macintosh is still in uh bi- home theater bypass mode. The the Macintosh is not touching anything, it's just acting as an amplifier. The Denon is in stereo listening mode. Not not pure, not pure direct, not direct, none of that. Just no. stereo listening mode and uh ha- have a listen that way and be amazed at the slam that is still present <laughs> still present in there like, <laughs> just make sure because denon does this you, there is a separate uh speaker Setting. setup yeah settings for stereo for stereo 
Yeah, so well, you have to there go can into the be, yeah. But there by can be, yes. by default, it doesn't have to be different, but they allow it to be different specifically yeah. for people who are like for some reason the two channel needs to be different from the surround sound. Uh, but yeah, but if you just leave it alone, if you don't touch any of that uh, alternate uh, two channel setup in the den, and then it'll just be uh, as default. So yeah. There you go. I don't know that that's true. I, I think with my Denon, it defaulted to a different crossover. In stereo listening mode? Stereo listening mm, mode, yes. Okay. And maybe I don't remember. Mm. I don't remember. It's been a long time. So go into the stereo listening mode settings right. in your Denon and make sure that they match yeah. whatever you have set up for multi-channel. For sure. So look, it, it's, just, it's just speaker set to small, crossover set the same, yes. and subwoofer set to on. That's but all you really have to do. If... If you are not willing to do any of that, if you are determined to keep using the Macintosh equipment, then you would want to do the editing of the curve in that MEN 220 that you have rather than in the subwoofers, because of course the subwoofers would end up applying that EQ regardless of what you listen to. That said, SVS does give you uh, like memory banks. So it is possible you could do the EQ adjustment in the SVS, set it to one of those memory banks, and then just turn that off when you go back to using the Denon. So it is possible to still do it inside the SVS, but you would then need to go into the SVS app every time you switch between whether you're using the Denon or you're using the Macintosh drive things. And uh, switch that preset. All right. I don't know. Let's just do one more. We I'm hoping we can do two if we can. Let's, let's, let's go a little long. I, I, I have, believe it or not, people coming to the house. Okay. I know that comes as a surprise. Well, let's do what we can. We'll do what we can. Raf. Raf received the two pairs of Kef Q50A wedge shaped speakers he had ordered, and he promptly mounted them high up on his front and back walls as front heights and rear heights. Mm -hmm. Despite us poo pooing the Oromatic up mixer, he, he is impressed by it. Okay. I, I didn't say you wouldn't be impressed by it. I just said it's just the same thing as the rest of it. It's stupid. I'm fine with so, it. He fully intends to keep using it for everything that isn't already an immersive audio mix in Atmos or DTSX. Mm -hmm. He adding the two pairs of height speakers has brought him up to an 11 speaker system, but his Denon X8500H can process up to 13 speakers. So what's next? Mm -hmm. Front wides, top middles, center height, and voice of God. Which of those additional channels will work with the Oromatic Uck mixer? Since that is now his preferred up mixer to use with movies, he's noticed that if he simply tries adding them to Denon's amp assigned settings without fixing connecting any additional speakers at the moment, not all speakers show up as being active on the Denon's display. Mm -hmm. So what's the best way for, for him to maximize the 13 speaker capabilities of his X8500H? I'm going to tell you some things that are going to make you unhappy, but one of them is that not all speakers in all these configurations will work. They just, well... they just don't. Out of those three options, because those are the, are the three options, he could add front wides, he could add top middles and have six overhead speakers, front heights, top middles, rear heights, or he could add the center height and voice of God. There is one of those options that will actually utilize all 13 speakers in all three immersive audio formats, and that would be adding top middles. Because your X8500H did get the update that allows you to use top middles uh. as the voice of God channel in Oro. So either Oromatic or if it is actual Oro 3D content, uh, it'll be playing the two top middle speakers in mono as the single voice of God channel when you do that. But then it will also now have six separate overhead speakers when you're playing Atmos and six separate overhead speakers when you're playing DTS-X. So if you want the one that gets the most utilization and where all 13 of your speakers are active at all times, regardless of the listening format, add the top middles. Simple answer. All right. Well, they, they made that change without me yeah, knowing. Yeah, because front wides, front wides never get used by Oro or the Oromatic right. up mixer, so front wides not useful for Oro and the, the center height and the top voice of God one won't be used by anything other yeah, than Yeah, they Oro. only get used by Oro. They can't be used by Atmos. So, but top middles can be used by everything. So that's the universal answer. For when they first came out, the top middles, they were like, oh yeah, that's Oromatic won't use those. <laughs> <laughs> to make they any sense. First. That's right. Yeah, it was there, really dumb. There was an update. Not every Denon and Marantz receiver got it, but your X8500H did, so you're in luck. Daniel. Daniel is setting up a small home theater in his basement. The full size of the basement is 20 by 20. Uh, he's already got a pair of SVS SB1000 subs on him with no intention of spending more any extra money at this time to upgrade them. That's so okay. It's a little too small. They're a little too small, but we totally get that. That's reasonable. And yeah. you still have subwoofers that are doing a heck of a better job than a whole lot of other subwoofer options yeah. that are out there. So that's okay. 
The rest of the speakers he has on hand are leftovers from prior setups. Mm -hmm. The only ones he likes enough to continue using are the Energy Take Classics, which he figures are still good enough to serve as a pair of surrounds. Mm -hmm. He wants to get three new speakers up front. I thought you said he didn't want to spend any more money, boss. No, it's the that? only thing he's willing to spend some money on. Yeah. But he wants to keep the price down when he does a quick search. He keeps getting the Clips reference series as a suggestion. Mm -hmm. That's because stupid Reddit. <laughs> uh, and also, Clips spends a month just a buttload of money on advertising sure but he is also considering the elac debut 2.0 series or an nht super one series speakers should you go with any of those options are the clips as good as they're being advertised the reference no. series not so much no. nah. uh, the next one up is uh, premiere reference premiere yeah, reference premiere pretty darn nice yeah yeah or is there another front three option around the same price that we recommend more highly there is for okay me. well okay so we have to assume that since your room is 20 by 20 yeah um you're going to be sitting somewhere around nine to eleven feet from a speaker from these speakers. It could be, yeah, because I mean, it sounded in his email that he's not utilizing the entire twenty by twenty yeah. space as the theater. It's like a section of that. I don't so know if, if you were to cut it in half so it was ten sure. by twenty, you would sure. not be facing the long wall. Almost certainly, probably you're not. going to be facing yeah. the the short wall. Yeah, is what I would think. So you're going to be around the middle of the space between nine and eleven feet. Hopefully, one would think. Uh, so. That does play a bit of a part in this. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing to consider, too, is that you're not physically separating these two spaces. So there's not going to be a wall with a right. door. Yeah. So you do have to consider the fact that your subwoofers, which are already going to be struggling a little bit in this space, yeah. your subwoofers are going to need to cross over into your speakers, which are going to need to be able to fill the space with enough bass so that crossover is Yeah, into the crossover convincing. region. Yeah. So you do want something that's a little bit more oomph than maybe Ideally, you, might, sure. you might need because you could be sitting 12 feet away from these speakers. Sure. You could be. And um, I'm also thinking, though, that like we can definitely get you an upgrade. Like if the Energy Take Classics, which are nice speakers, I like those speakers. If those are the nicest speakers that you have and he's looking in the, you know, under $200 each, under $400 a pair type of range uh, for these speakers, you know, just going by Elite Debut are on his list and, and NHT Super Ones are on his list. Um, you know, we can get you something that, that sounds better, uh, performs uh, higher, but maybe isn't like ideal for this room size. But they themselves could quite easily transition to being your surrounds in the future, uh, and and you go with you know even larger, more capable front speakers at some point in the future when more money is available. Like that's that's sort of along the lines that I'm thinking. So where I would point you sort of immediately because when I saw this price range, I'm like, oh yes, I would point you to Ascend Acoustics. They're now calling it their signature series, but it's the the SE series. Uh, their HTM 200 SE speakers, which are like very easy to use in pretty much any location. They're showing it here next to a uh, CD jewel case so you get an idea of the size. It's like two CD jewel cases high and then they're about six inches deep. Uh, you can wall mount them. You can put them in a cabinet. They're a sealed design. They have this offset tweeter to the dual uh, woofers that they've got in there. So if you're placing them close to a wall, you can ameliorate some of that by putting the tweeter on the inside or if they're up near a ceiling, you can put the tweeter away from the ceiling. All these types of things are options with the HTM 200 SE. The center version is literally just the same speaker rotated 90 degrees and they rotate the logo on the um on the uh, grill so if you want to create a pair out of it in the future you can just add another single one in the future there are 338 dollars for a pair they're 188 dollars for the center version but if you order three of them together they give you a little discount 498 dollars just shy of 500 dollars for all three of those speakers as a group from ascend uh you know that's a 28 dollars savings versus getting the the pair and the center separately so so I really like those because they are a as close to a universally useful speaker <laughs> as I know of. And the sound quality, the tweeter in that speaker is like better than anything else at that price range, in my opinion. Um, so I really like those speakers. They can play louder and lower than you would imagine, given their compact size. They are not teeny tiny. Be aware of that. But uh, yeah, I like everything about them. So I feel very comfortable recommending those to you. Yeah, those are good. I, I, I could get behind that. I was looking at the HSU. Um, yep. Yep. HB ones. I agree. Uh, you can get a the front three for they do come in as a 
as a discount, yep. uh, but it's still just under seven hundred dollars. So, so a little it's not bit cheap. more expensive, but it's those are more efficient. The HSU yes. speakers with their horn-loaded tweeters, they are more efficient. Uh, more decibels coming out per watt. So if you're using uh, a less expensive AV receiver and you're still trying to contend with this 20 by 20 space that you're in, uh, yeah, those HSU HB1s, a little bit more expensive than the Ascends, but they are more efficient. So that I am on board with that very much. Yeah. Um, those would allow you to not worry about the rest of the room as much True. how big the rest of the room was and they're was. better than the clips reference i don't i and, wouldn't necessarily say they're better than clips reference premiere but clips reference premiere costs more than the hsu h yeah. uh, b1s for sure so uh yeah i i would go with those hsus over the clips reference for sure all right who do we have left on the list we have rob m different rob from me so i put that m in there uh dane and i gotta scroll past some images there with him because i put a bunch of them on the list Bo, oh Bo is going to be fun sorry Bo, that we didn't get to this week but that's going to be well, that's going to be a fun discussion and uh elvin is on the list as well so those will be the first ones up next week all right we want to thank our listeners of the week to become a listener of the week uh you have to do a support us in some way one of the ways you do that is going to avrant.com click on the bias cup coffee link and send us a PayPal donation like Raf and Dane did this week. Thank you very much to Raf and Dane. That's right. We had some PayPal donations. So Raf and Dane, thank you for those. We appreciate your financial support. So I want to thank our 129 patrons over at patreon.com slash podcast. That's right. Well, I'll say it one more time. Patreon.com slash podcast is the place to go to sign up to make an automatic monthly donation. So big thanks to our 129 patrons over there. Big thanks to Dane for giving me uh, permission to use his photos on avgadgets.com. Thank you, Dane. I'll have to make sure to forward that to Tom because I didn't do that before we started the podcast. <laughs> and we got notes of gratitude from Dan, Ryan, Jay, JR, Brandon, Dane, and Alvin. Thank you very much for thanking us. That's right. Once again, Dan, Ryan, Jay, JR, Brandon, Dane, and Alvin, thank you for your notes of gratitude and encouragement. We super duper appreciate it. And a big, big thank you to everybody who continues to listen and send in your questions. If you want to get your question answered, all you have to do is ask. You ask by emailing us at question at avrant.com. For AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. Want your question answered? Send it to question at avrant.com. is A.V. Rant. Now go out and listen to something.